Uh, good morning to all. Um, um, my name is uh, Nataron Mo, and I am the director of CKS. A few words about uh, CKS for the one of you that is uh, not familiar with the center and the work we do. The C CKS stands for the Center for Khmer Studies. And uh, it, uh, the center was created in 2000. So already 21 years from now, we operate two offices in Cambodia, one in Siem Reap and one other in Phnom Penh. And we offer a variety of research program and fellowships. And please do consult our website, khmaistudies.org to learn more and to see the details of the program available so that you can promote them to your students uh, if, uh, if you think they are relevant. CKS promotes research, teaching, and public service in the social science and human arts and the humanities in Cambodia and its region. Therefore, we as TKS are very glad to host today's digital workshop on epigraphy in Southeast Asia. I would like to particularly thank uh, Hunter Watson for all his work and leadership for the preparation, coordination, and organization of this event together with all our dear CKS colleague, colleagues that made it possible. CKS is very interested to support a larger in-person event in 2022, should the pandemic allow, and it seems like it is a good start, the reopening of all the borders and everything uh, recently. So uh, we would like to do so with all of you and more any other relevant key partner institution from the region, more uh, formal partnership with the FAO, with the Absara Authority as well. For this purpose, there is an important thing toward the end of the morning where you will be discussing, discussing the possibility of such events and uh, what would be its goal and possible format. So therefore, I wish all of you a very fruitful discussion and uh, fruitful uh, uh, epigraphy knowledge sharing. I would like to now give the floor to uh, Hunter Watson. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for um, inviting me to organize and to host in this event. So uh, I would like to thank everyone for participating. Um, I know it's a bit strange to have this sort of uh, extended workshop in a virtual format. And so I'm very glad that you have had the interest uh, and the engagement to participate in this with us. Um, in addition to all of us who are participating in the workshop today, we do have a very small invited audience. Um, and so I would just like to explain for the audience that originally this was intended in early 2020, we had envisaged, uh, envisaged this as a, a workshop to be held in Siem Reap and we were going to bring together um, a group of scholars. Uh, I believe most of you were present at the uh, SAC epigraphy workshop in about 2015, maybe. Um, I was not a participant of that workshop, but I was there as an audience member. And I was very influenced by the fact that a group of epigraphy scholars were able to come together to, to network and to share their work. And in, uh, in the years since then, as I have continued with my graduate studies, I've noticed that there are not really conferences for epigraphy scholars. And also uh, most other conferences like archeology span conferences tend not to have panels for epigraphy scholars. And so I feel like for many of us, we end up trying to take our work and insert it into other conversations wherever we can fit in. And so um, I've been kind of pushing to try to help build kind of, uh, or to, to expand on a platform where epigraphers can, can work together and share their information. And this includes uh, the year before last, I uh, organized a panel for epigraphy for the SPAFA conference held in Bangkok, and it was a great success. And so now that I'm working on my PhD, um, I'm a research fellow at the Center for Khmer Studies, and they opened the opportunity for me to host some sort of event. And so my idea was this exactly, to have an event where we could bring together epigraphy scholars to kind of see each other since we don't often meet very frequently and to kind of uh, update, you know, the the um, the progress of our work in this field, and also kind of the state of the studies of epigraphy throughout mainland Southeast Asia. So, originally, we wanted to fly you all into Siem Reap for a couple nights, and, and then COVID happened, and so we had to postpone. 
And in late 2020, we had discussed the possibility of arranging this as a virtual workshop. But in 2020, I think many of us were still not that comfortable using Zoom. And so we didn't want to do an extended uh, two-day workshop. And so we uh, brainstormed on the format. And in the end, we decided to do a one-day uh, workshop. And uh, in total, we invited 12 people. And a few people were unable to attend uh, or they were uncomfortable to present in a virtual workshop. And so we have a slightly smaller group. But I think it's a good start. Uh, if it's too large, maybe it's a bit more difficult to manage. And so I think this should be a, a good group and small enough that it's kind of warm and welcoming feeling. Um, so uh, as Mr. Natarun mentioned, we do still plan to have a physical workshop in Simrip whenever the situation um, presents itself. So we're waiting for travel restrictions to ease. Hopefully next year in 2021, we will be able to host such a workshop in Simrip and invite all of you there. Or if some of you can't come, then we will allow you to present virtually over Zoom. But hopefully, many of us can come together physically. Uh, and we anticipate that we can invite uh, more people and possibly have a, a function which is maybe two days or something like that. Um, if next year travel restrictions do not permit us to have a workshop, we will probably still move forward with another virtual workshop like this one. And so at the end of our workshop today, we will have a, a, a brief discussion and I will, I will ask if any of you have any uh, comments or suggestions that you would like to contribute towards the organization of such a workshop. And also after this event, we will be sending you a questionnaire to ask some of your ideas and opinions if you think we might uh, do something better or do something different in the future moving forward. Okay, so um, our presentation today, uh, our, uh, our schedule, we will begin with a keynote address by Dr. Peter Skilling. Um, after Peter Skilling's address, we will have uh, a series of each of us giving our short presentations. Um, following each presentation, we will have essentially a Q&A session, but we have elected not to call it a Q&A session, but rather a discussion section. And the reason for that is um, our idea was it's not just speakers asking questions directly from the presenter, but we want to encourage you to speak to each other. So you may have a question for the speaker and then following that someone else may have a comment about your question or they may want to contribute something. And so we've rather than calling it Q and A, we're calling it discussion. And so following each lecture, we will open for basically uh, open the table uh, for free discussion uh, among the participants. Now, as I've mentioned, there are a few audience uh, members who are also watching today. So the audience members, um, they are not able to turn on their video or their audio, but audience members are able to send us chat messages. So for each presentation, we have allotted a specific amount of time for the uh, discussion. Um, if the discussion settles out and we have time remaining, then we will return to the audience members. But if we do not have time, then we will skip over the audience members' questions. And I would I have to apologize to the audience for that. And I will inform you that if we're unable to address your questions, then after the conference, we will uh, put you in contact with the speakers by email and you can ask them your questions directly. Um, I would like to ask for whoever's not presenting, please put your um, microphone on mute to, um, to not distract the presenter. Um, and then when we finish and we reach the discussion section, you're free to turn on your microphone and speak up as you will. Uh, we'll have a few lectures today and then we'll have a little 10 minute break in the middle so everyone can, can uh, get a drink and go to the bathroom. And uh, first things before I turn over to Dr. Peter Skilling, we would like to take a group photograph. And so we would first ask for everyone to turn on your camera for just a moment while our coordinator takes a screenshot of everyone who's here today. If I could ask you to do that now. Okay, I'll do one more. And I think Sanghi will take a video also. Okay, and let's do one more. Let's see, I have a few people on here now. So uh, next, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Peter Skilling for agreeing to give a keynote address. And I would like to turn over to Peter to begin his presentation. Uh, I will first say that I am not particularly familiar or comfortable with uh, using Zoom, so I hope I do not make too many mistakes. Uh, it's a pleasure 
to be here today with you all, at least notionally in Phnom Penh. I appreciate the vision of the Center for Khmer Studies, Apsara and the AFAO, and all others involved in organizing this workshop. I thank Mr. Natarun, director of the CKS for inviting me to speak today. And I thank Hunter Watson for all the effort and energy he has put into this and his skillful coordination. Uh, this refers, what I've written before refers to what Hunter just said. Uh, why do I describe the idea of the conference as an evolving vision? which implies something more than just common planning and organization. This is because I believe that epigraphy is a field of great import that is too often neglected. And I believe that epigraphy is critical and crucial, that it is a key skill in the, in, in the study of history in all of its multiple dimensions, this is something we should not forget. I'm sure none of us will or do forget, but it is also something we should not let the administrators and planners forget, ignore, or downplay. Epigraphy needs to be recognized as a high impact science that should enjoy the support and understanding of responsible faculties of education and research. Now, I have prepared two things for this talk. Uh, one is the talk, which became, uh, as often with me, uh, became too long, so it actually turns into a course. <laughs> and then I have prepared a PowerPoint, which doesn't quite coincide with what I intend to say today say today. So I hope it'll work out. I'll start with some excerpts from, from the talk. However, to say just a few words about epigraphy is not easy. I suppose that I am always thinking about epigraphy and puzzling over epigraphs, like all of you. And we hope, like many students of, of uh, epigraphy or research. Of course, there are two words. There's the word epigrapher and epigraphist, which I believe are, have the same meaning. Uh, there are not many people who are just epigraphists. There should be more. Unfortunately not. There have been government positions, for example, in the Archaeological Survey of India, uh, epigraphist with different categories. And there have been some great epigraphists, chief epigraphists, and so on. I have heard that nowadays it's hard for them to get highly qualified epigraphists because of the lack of interest among the students or the insecurity that if you study epigraphy, like many other precious sciences, archaeology, ancient languages, you can't get a job. So that is a question that we can discuss that as the days go by, as the time goes by. Anyway, I'm always puzzling, frequently puzzling over epigraphs. Constantly, I'm writing fascicles, uh, fascicles, which remain perpetually unpublished, like this talk. In the short time available to me, I cannot give even a general survey. I will limit myself to my own narrow interests, which mainly concern Buddhist studies in the early period. That's to say, uh, Buddhist, up to Buddhist era 1000 or 1500. And I should warn you that my interest in current research is mainly in early Indian archaeology and epigraphy and texts. 
but I can't resist looking at Southeast Asian epigraphs either. Anyway, even here, there's a lot to talk about, too much to talk about. I hope to cite, have time to cite a few examples from my own work. My long paper deals with scope, the scope in space and time of the epigraphs of the epigraphic art with its passage through history. Epigraphy has a deep history, epigraphy in general has a deep history. I can call, we can call this the Atidure Nidana. And it starts with the beginning of writing in ancient West Asia or Middle East or Lower Asia or Southeast, Southeast Asia. Our modern terms never uh, exactly fit or sometimes are not politically correct for the moment. Um, <clears throat> immediately relevant to our studies, the background of our studies, the Dure Nidana is Greco-Roman beginnings. And the history of the art involved in epigraphy and the tools that we use, I find this very interesting. The evolution of eye copies and rubbings, photography, and most recently, digitization. So I have been looking at some of the, at the early literature. It depended, hmm, I suppose the earliest literature depended entirely on eye copies, copies made using the eye without any mechanical assistance. I have not seen any uh, exact history of eye copies that may be difficult. They are used in the works of Sonar, for example. Um, the, I don't know if you can see this or not. But, Inscriptions of Piedasi, the Ashokan inscriptions. The early study of the Ashokan inscriptions is done entirely with, not entirely, uh, with largely with eye copies in conjunction with estampage and at later period photography. So there was actually a kind of period of uh, using these three techniques or media to study inscriptions. And you see that very nicely in, in the discussion of his uh, technique in Alexander Cunningham's volume one of Corpus Inscriptionum Indicarum, just three pages. But there you can see clearly he's, these media are interacting. And skilled eye copies are very useful and they have to be done, I think even today, Maybe not now with a good digital camera. Some of the ones, for example, some things that were transcribed by Ajahn Gonkel in the Silver Gorn Journal or other publications were eye copies. That's the, um, the tablets, the so called votive tablets or prapim from Yarang. These are two tiny at that time to photograph properly and they're very fragile. Now digital photographs can probably take care of that. And again, some of the gold plates that are very hard to photograph because of the uh, reflection. And they uh, also are done, for example, the uh, Pali inscription in the Buddha image at Wat Chai Watanaram. So we should not look down on the old technologies like eye copies. Rubbings, as you all know, as we all know, are still very useful and is very useful to digitize the rubbings. And I hope there are programs. I'm not very uh, up to date with the latest uh, Pro programs. There are programs, I hope there are programs to digitize rubbings of Southeast Asian inscriptions in the various countries or 
the AFAO and French collections in Paris. That is extremely important because that paper is fragile and they everything deteriorates. Sabang and Chang. So a buzzword of contemporary studies is corpus. In Southeast Asian epigraphy, there are, I think, uh, two different conceptualizations of corpus come into play. I'm again going to the background. That means Greco-Roman and Chinese. The former, the Greco-Roman branches into European. That's the background of European epigraphic studies. And that was brought to India and Southeast Asia, to South and Southeast Asian studies by the, during the colonial period. So the background of South Asian studies itself is big. And today that includes seven, I believe, modern nations, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Afghanistan, Nepal, uh, sorry, Sri Lanka, Maldives, Nepal, and Afghanistan. It's noteworthy that five of these were unwit unwittingly and unwillingly uh, part of the British Empire. And of course, the French colonial uh, period also is very important in the development of epigraphy in Cambodge, Cambodia, and Vietnam and in Southeast Asia. My main interest is Buddhist epigraphy, but I want to stress that we cannot study Buddhist epigraphy alone. The development of scripts, techniques and technologies and languages in different states are all interrelated and cannot be segregated by religion or ethnicity. That means we need to study epigraphy globally. The languages of the earlier period in India were largely Prakrits and Sanskrit. And I also do research in Tibetan and Thai sources. Second of which, as you know, involves several dialects and scripts or alphabets. Other important languages are Mon Khmer, Mon Khmer family. Uh, in this, in my talk, in this paper, I leave out the Sinitic cultures, which are huge and fascinating, also in the relation between epigraphy, epigraphs, and calligraphy and aesthetics. One of my major studies is Pali inscriptions. Pali is a Middle Indic language. I once proposed that Pali epigraphy belonged to two epigraphical zones, both in Southeast Asia, both in mainland Southeast Asia. The Western zone or lower Burma, the Irrawaddy Delta, and an Eastern zone, uh, the Chaupriya Delta and the plains area of Siam, and not only the plains. And this became quite complicated to work this out. And an important point is that these two zones have seen the continuous use of Pali from about the fifth or sixth centuries CE through the second millennium to the present. So these zones, there was some basis in the collections of inscriptions for the idea of these two zones. However, I later realized that the division is somewhat arbitrary and that it impedes research by setting up a priori frames of reference. The interesting important point is that Pali Buddhist epigraphical zones lie quite outside, entirely outside, the areas where Middle Indic languages developed. There are no Pali epigraphic zones 
in India or Sri Lanka. Um, for example, there aren't any early Pali inscriptions in Sri Lanka. There aren't any, even any middle period Pali inscriptions in Sri Lanka. Now, this can be a result of epigraphic habits and so on, as it is certainly in part, but it is also an interesting reality that there's no evidence, archeological or epigraphical evidence for the use of Pali in Sri Lanka in the whole early period, even the first millennium, in well into the second millennium. So these Pali epigraphic zones then lie in Southeast Asia, areas where the dominant languages are not Indic at all but are Tibeto-Burman, Austro-Asiatic, and thai Gadai, um, quite different from the Indic languages. So that's a curiosity, I, I think, that is worth bearing in mind. For later Pali works as well, I find that Pali scholars in our ivory towers uh, often right, as if Pali works are written by Pali people living in Pali Desa, and that is not the case. Pali literature is written, especially later Pali literature, uh, is written by people with other linguistic backgrounds, other, uh, and they're not, not necessarily from Sri Lanka at all, from South India, Tamil lands, or from Southeast Asia. So these, I think, curiosities should be borne in mind. When I saw the limitations of the two-zone model, and when I did various researches, I realizing that the presence of Pali is bound up with the presence of the Theravada, or Theravangsa, or Theriya Sangha, I, I realized I got the idea that the Terawangsa has always been here. I wrote an article, published an article in the JSS with that title. The Terawangsa has always been here. That is to say, the Terya Sangha, Theravada Sangha, did not arrive late in the 11th, 10th, 11th. 12th century, as has been proposed in some earlier works. I don't know. Nowadays, I think that is not so prominent. But the Theravada Sangha has already been there. But I do not mean by this use of the word zone, uh, I do not mean monolithic or exclusive areas, but areas where the mon monasteries and activities of the Teras are, are or were interspersed with those of other schools. Uh, for which there is not much evidence, but there are some Sanskritic uh, language itself is not an evidence alone. I think there are some evidences in Southeast Asia for perhaps the Sarvastivada or the Samatiya school. And we always quote Yi Jing's, Yi Jing's uh, statement about the languages, which is a little bit hard to follow. Uh, there, so they were the Theravangsa was interspersed with other with the schools and other religious communities or groupings such as Shaivite, Vaishnavite, or Saura. It was a fluctuating landscape, changing with patronage and economic and political political factors. Inscriptions count as written records which we can use to study history in all its aspects, social, economic, literary, religious, and so on. In the Indic cultural wor world, manuscripts were written on perishable supports. For example, birch bark, bark, palm leaf, paper, or cloth. It's safe to say, I think at the moment anyway, uh, that no manuscripts survived from the first 1,500 years 
of the Christian era in Southeast Asia. What do, does survive, what do survive are inscriptions on stone and metal and some other supports. Epigraphic records are primary, therefore primary records for the study of history, religion, literature in combination with material culture, architecture, carving, landscape, technologies like irrigation products, projects, and so on. A recent dissertation from the University of Texas at Austin uses epigraphy as a primary source to study Buddhist patronage networks in the early historical period. That's just an example of the value of the study of epigraphy. This is Matthew David Milligan of Rags and Riches, Indian Buddhist patronage, and so on at the University of Texas in Austin. So as we know, epigraphy has important and multiple people, aspects of importance for the study of cultural history. I have a long section on the beginnings of epigraphy. Uh, so you can skip here. The idea of corpus is the ordered or curated collection. And all of this sort of starts with Greek and Latin, Greco Latin uh, cultures in Europe. Not, not to speak of the Atidure Milano from the uh, Middle East. So all of these things were brought together, flowed into around the world, instituted by the colonial powers as they explored the rapidly expanding worlds that they began to encounter or appropriate in India and the East Indies. This encounter was hugely significant since the spolia, the spoils of the colonial project contributed to the new world to the new world views of the enlightenment that were simultaneously transforming the metropoles themselves. So these networks of ideas connected, centering in many ways around epigraphy because chronology often depends on epigraphy. These networks of ideas were interactive from the very beginning. It wasn't just European ideas creating an artificial science, even if the first tools came through the colonial period, they were immediately uh, adapted into the shared discourse. Uh, so I would like to stress here, we haven't had, as having these workshops is an excellent idea, and I hope there will be more, and they will, the idea will broaden to give the idea, give the concepts, the knowledge of the importance of epigraphy, and to create new epigraphers and epigraphists, both, and epigraphists as well. Daniel Perret's edited volume, Writing for Eternity, is a uh, big step forward. There was nothing really like that before. There were miscellaneous articles here and there. Uh, some of you, some of us here today have contributed to it. And it was a long overdue step in celebrating the what I call the mosaic of epigraphic Southeast Asia in a single volume. Reading this volume, looking through this volume recently, I am impressed once more by the complexity and intricacy of the subject. Nothing in epigraphy is ever simple. I think we all know that, uh, but that is part of the attraction and joy of epigraphic studies. They are often puzzles. 
Uh, so in the longer paper, I discuss, I as I mentioned, I copies and escompage, rubbings, impressions. And uh, one of my studies in my published work for a long time has been impressions on clay. That means clay tablets, uh, prapim in Thai. And this, these are a major type of inscription in South and Southeast Asia, which has generally been ignored by the archaeologists. The Indian reports will always say they excavated some site, important site, like Shravasti, Vaishali, whatever. And in such and such a Vihara, they found hundreds or thousands. I think Cunningham even sometimes says tens of thousands of clay tablets or clay stupas. And then they will say something like inscribed with the usual Buddhist creed. That's the end, end of the discussion. But in fact, these uh, tablets have different scripts, um, use different scripts, and they do not have only the Ye Dharma, but also Dharanis. So the study of these are very important for understanding uh, Buddhist ritual, ritual texts used, the Dharanis used. Of course, these were very much more difficult to study before. They're often, in the old reports, they are poorly or impossibly reproduced. But now with the um, technology, we can make good, clear images of these tablets and study not only their texts, but also their iconography when they have imagery. And that is just beginning to be done. I guess some um, Gurgli Hidas has a chapter in a new book on um, Bodh Gaya, a very, of course, a key site also for Southeast Asia. Um, Treasures from the Diamond Throne, published as a monograph by the British Library. And Gurgli uh, studies some of the Garanis in the British, in the Cunningham collection in the British Library. And also the Dharanis have been studied recently by a number of scholars for Southeast Asia as well. But still, we don't have a um, comprehensive study of the circulation of Dharanis. Even the names of the Dharanis were not formally recognized. Now it's information is there and it's possible to identify them. And the fascinating thing is this links up to a big network of ritual and textual practice going not only through India, Southeast Asia, both mainland and insular Southeast Asia, and then also throughout India, um, Central Asia, the Himalayas, uh, where the practice of Im impressing these tablets is still quite strong, and the uh, Eastern Asia and Eastern Asia. And this again connects to the origins of printing because it was Dharanis that were first printed in the sixth or seventh century in East Asia. Uh, so there's a lot there. I, part of my perfectly unpublished classical. Uh, uh, what is the time in, in Phnom Penh? Uh, <laughs> or how much time do I have? We're, we're about good, unless you have any final comments you would like to make. Okay. Yeah, I had a PowerPoint, but I couldn't combine the two of them. So I wanted to stress a few of the things that I have worked on. But I think uh, somebody was preparing a selection of a list of my publications on epigraphy. I don't know. If we get that, then we can have it sent to the uh, members of this group. Yeah, I think I wanted to stress very much the, these, these aspects. Each one uh, can be a lecture in itself. 
the importance, the significance of epigraphy, the fact that we need to, uh, I believe that we need to pay close attention to the history of the epigraphic arts and the technology of the epigraphic arts, not just race into digital pictures without looking at the previous work that has been done and to see it as, as Hunter mentioned, and I think Matthew mentioned, see it as a epigraphy as a network and uh, stretching beyond, not, not only in Southeast Asia, but beyond Southeast Asia. And what is immediately relevant is not only India, but also can be Himalayan culture and sometimes broader range of cultures. So it's a, it's a big subject and having intimate workshops like this is an excellent idea. I personally, of course, prefer not to be through doing this all through the screen, but that's the way things are at, at the moment. And I hope we will be able to meet again. I see Natarun seems to be in Phnom Penh. It looks very nice there in his, <laughs> his background. Um, and then also we have the advantage from that, such a meeting that we can see real epigraphs in museums or elsewhere. So I think I should leave it here. And I have no idea. We have 15 minutes till the next speaker. Is that it? Okay. So we don't have to rush. I can ask a question before people ask me question. questions. And that is, Hunter, are those real books or is that a massive photograph behind you? Uh, thank you. These, these are all real books. These are my bookshelf. I keep it close to me so when I need things, I can reach them. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Skilling, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I would like to open the floor if anyone has a question for Peter or if you would like to contribute with a comment or an opinion. Dr. Utain? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, really nice to uh, listen to your really uh, brief and interesting lectures. Uh, I, uh, you already mentioned the school of Samitya, right, in Soviet Asia. So I, uh, there is any inscription evidence uh, for this school of Samitya in Thailand or in Soviet Asia? Oh, thank you. Good, very good question. Uh, which I can more or less answer. I have to remind you, remind everyone that I'm getting old and forgetful. I might not remember the details well. But of course, um, the famous passage of I Ching says that the four great schools of Buddhism, including Samitya, were moving into Southeast Asia at that time. So he says that. The evidence for Samitya, the evidence for for Nikayas generally depends on donative records. Like in India, they will say, I am donating this Buddha image to the Maha Sanghika Sangha for benefit all being, of all beings and so on. So that type of donative inscription doesn't seem to exist in Southeast Asia. So the concern of these donative inscriptions seem to be that the um, donors wanted to give to a specific sangha. It seems to me that the donations here must have been done orally, largely. Like today, people go to the temple sometimes and have a big sanghatan and everything is done orally. Maybe there's some signing a little on a Motana but or something. But basically it's an oral process. So we don't have that kind of evidence. There's almost no evidence. They're not 
the Nikayas and other religious groups didn't announce their uh, control or whatever you want to say of sites. They don't. They didn't have signs saying this vihara is for uh, Sarvastivadins only, or this is a samatiya vihara, or this is a samatiya image, and so on. So uh, the absence of references to Nikayas, which I think is pretty well complete in Southeast Asia, is I think understandable. The evidence for Samatiya even in India, mainly, is the language. They used a particular Prakrit, which again to the problem of the Ye Dharma, they have their own recension which we now know from some manuscript, a manuscript colophon of, the summit, of a Samatiya work. They have a Prakrit recension of the Ye Dharma. And we know more about this Prakrit, which was often in this attitude of the great early scholars, uh, sort of dismissed as the usual Buddhist creed. They didn't look at the linguistics. So we can sort of reconstruct that for India. Here, there is one example. In, here means in Cambodia. Actually, there is one example of a Ye Dharma that is in this. And one characteristic of it is Awacha, Tathagato Awacha. Uh, the Pali is Tathagato Aha. The standard Sanskrit you see on hundreds, thousands of images and tablets is hi awadat, tathagato hi awadat, tathagata hi dhamma hi tathagata, and so on, tathagato hi awadat. Uh, that is the standard Sanskrit. The Pali is tathagato aha, and the samatiya and some others maybe are tathagato avacca. Now these have the same meaning. But the distinctive literary fo form suggests the samatiyas. Uh, which image is that? I, <laughs> I can't remember now. And then there are, as a gold plate inscription from Koh Soi in Vietnam that is also in what seems to be the samatiya prakrit. So, yes, I think there is this evidence. I think even the, maybe the Buddha image in um, the National Museum, Bangkok, uh, but that was presented from India, actually, uh, has the Samatiya Prakrit version. The one statue, uh, Peter, you may be thinking of, if I recall correctly, is the standing Buddha image from perhaps Angkor Bore, which is at the Gimei Museum. Uh, on the back. With the on the back of the shoulder, I remember it has the variant of the Yetama. Oh, yeah, that may be the one. Yes, thank you. I have written about it, but I've forgotten the details. Mm -hmm. I have a long article about the Samatiyas, largely in India. And the, the point about them is that in India, they were probably the biggest. Nikaya, the biggest school at the time of Shrensang's visit. And people bring together all of his references. But very little evidence. And only recently have some, a very few texts been identified. And they use a very distinctive Prakrit close to Pali, but not the same. And usually the old epigraphical archaeological researches call it corrupt Pali or corrupt Sanskrit and Pali. And as you know, the history of the names of scripts is a big confusion. The old ones like uh, Cunningham, maybe even Sanar, uh, called Karoshti Ariano Pali script. And that was 
So there are these old names which cause confusion that there were these. This is an old name for the script, nothing to do with the language, which was Kurushti. So thank you for the question. Are there any other questions or comments? Uh, Peter, I would like to ask you, I know you were mentioning about eye copies, rubbings, uh, photos, and digitization. And I myself have struggled sometimes when reading publications that have eye copies, um, particularly from like the 1800s. Sometimes they would even use like a putty or something and stick it into the letters and try to copy it. Uh, what is your idea or your approach to dealing with these eye copies and judging the accuracy of the readings? Uh, do you mean when there's no other record or when? Yeah, that's a problem. Uh, they may be accurate and they may not be. We have to judge it in the total picture. One example actually I have on the PowerPoint is from Kanheri in uh, north of Bombay. And that is a copper plate inscription found in, let's say, 1830 or so by a British officer in the ruins of a brick stupa outside of the rock cut temples of Kanheri, which is a great university of Western India, we could say. This very important rock cut inscription is not that early, I guess it's fifth, sixth century. Uh, it's an interesting donative inscription, royal inscription. And it refers to the installation of relics of Shariputra in this stupa. It's quite detailed. Uh, the eye copy was produced and published, and then seems to have had several stages of editing of the actual eye copy. The last one being by Bhagwan Lal Indraji, great Indian epigraphist. And when you look at that copy and read the inscription, it looks very good. And here, those copper plates are lost. So all we can really do is interpret uh, the quality of the Sanskrit. Of course, mistakes don't matter in inscriptions. I mean, they mistakes do occur, as we know. So uh, that one I, I think is important and relatively reliable. In other cases, so it depends on the knowledge of the person who does it. And I haven't seen ones in the early period that were interfered with much. I don't know if they were putting silly putty in or not. I don't think Alexander Cunningham's records say anything about a budget for silly putty. Um, um, so yeah. I mean, yeah, which cases do you? I mentioned this because the, uh, Peter, are you familiar with the Singapore stone? Oh yeah, I am. In but I mean so in, in Singapore, uh, when the British arrived, around maybe uh, the 1820s, there was a, a huge boulder with like 50 lines of text on it. And uh, for those of you that don't know the story, unfortunately, this huge inscription was on a rockhead at the mouth of the Singapore River, and the British found it in inconvenience. And so they exploded the rock into lots of small fragments. Um, and so today there's only a small fragment, a small piece of the inscription remains in the Singapore Museum. But of course, you know, the original inscription was massive and, and it doesn't exist anymore. And so the inscription doesn't exist and all we have is the publications. And the publications don't provide any rubbing or uh, of course, photograph, photography, they weren't using it then. And so they described this technique where they were putting putty into the letters and then looking at the putty and then drawing it. But when you look at their, their eye reproductions, um, as someone who's familiar with the script, you can barely recognize any, any letters of words. And so um, uh, it seems almost useless, uh, but some people still try to reference it and try reference the reading. And I kind of feel a bit more skeptical because the stone is not there for us to confirm with, and we don't have a rubbing and the eye copy seems 
not not sufficient enough. And so it, it, it makes me think there should be some reservation with, with some of the eye copies in, in certain cases, depending on, on whether we still have the, the actual artifact to compare with or not. Yeah, certainly I agree. And that is a very sad case of the uh, kind of colonial carelessness of getting things out of the way because they're inconvenient. And there are many others. In India, many inscriptions were uh, blown up on cliffs that were removed to make the, the wonderful Indian Railway. And there's a whole aspect, but I think we should study the inscriptions maybe more. But another interesting and sad study is the colonial, or even nowadays, the the development, uh, waste, destruction of evidence, which is going on everywhere. And the, the Viharas of Bihar, Bihara, Vihim, are, were everywhere in North India made of brick. And when they were building railways, they wanted the free brick to lay the bed for the tracks. So all the Haras stupas were dismantled for that purpose. So there is this um, problem of the loss of evidence and whatever evidence we have, we have to cherish, but of course we have to look at it critically. Some of the inscriptions I mentioned in Bihar, in the Himongir district, also relate to the Samatiyas. And there were many, many more. Apparently all those cliffs were blasted. And there are a few eye copies, maybe in the archeological reports of those two. And same thing, the artifact is gone. We can more or less believe that there was something there and that this is a sincere attempt to copy it, but it may be quite misguided. Next up, we have Dr. Utain presenting on the Kokbrik inscription. Dr. Utain? Uh, yes. Uh, I, uh, to preserve the uh, time, I already record it as a video clip. So I will open it on my iPad and then uh, I will be waiting for the discussion because I think uh, my topic should have much more question from the uh, Cambodian scholar because it's about the inscription of Cambodia. Good day, our eminent scholar. Today I will present a paper, the corporate inscription, a preliminary study. Introduction, the corporate inscription was discovered in around a decade ago in 2011 by Mr. Legion. It is from corporate or spell yes, like corporate village, corporate mediastic dementia province, Cambodia. Now it is kept at the Museum of Dementia province since December 9, 2011. The famous ancient temple of this province is Menteshwa, which was built in around 12th century by King Chikavarama the seven. And another one just nearby is called the Black Temple. Detail of inscription. The inscription has two faces. Phase one contains 20 lines. Phase B contains another 20 lines. Material is in stone in the form of Buddhist other stone or sema. The size is 92 centimeters in high, 39 centimeters in width, and 6 centimeters in deep. The number of the inscription was registered by EFEOSK uh, 1318. Here is the picture of the inscription. Objective of the research, this article 
present the translation of important verses from the inscription. Then identify the circular window of this inscription with information from other inscription. The translation is based on the reading of Professor Yang Willabot in the article corporate inscription, the newly found inscription of Jaya Varamanda Fort in 2016. Script and language. 20 Sanskrit verses were written with typical Angkorean Khmer script uh, datable to around the 10th to 11th century common era. Most Sanskrit verses are in understood method. Except the verse 19 is in Upachapi. Sincerely, the matter of this inscription is very really simple, uh, but the words used in this inscription is really difficult because it's used called Sabdalangala. The inscription begins with an invocation to Shiva, Vishnu, and Brahma in the first three stanzas. Following this, there is an invocation to the goddess Uma and Parati. Uh, Parati is another name of goddess Saraswati. The six words describe the superior quality of King Yasovaraman. There was King Yasovaraman who rather insisted on account of his fight in the battlefields, who had pure beauty and who was saluted by other great kings. The next verse mentioned the name of King Parasavraman the first, who was the son of the previous king. He had a son who was a king with irrespective fame named Siharasavraman whose lotus life feet were honored by all the kings. The eight was described the next king, Yusana Varaman II, who was the younger brother of Rasa Varaman I. He had a brother born from the same womb, who became king named Si Yusana Varaman, whose valor was like the sun for the darkness in the form of the enemies. The two final verses of Side A describe the high qualities of King Chaya Varaman the fourth. That king who was skillful in slaying the enemies was an honest king above other kings and whose ability was king Sri Chaya Varaman in the verse 10, Purity Gauri, born from the pure milk ocean. His wife, that was excellent in all quarter, but even though she was of the same state that of his Sri or Lakshmi, did not appear to have black complexion. Genealogy of kings in the inscription. We found that the first king in the inscription is Yasovaraman the first, and then Harasavaraman the first, who is the son of previous king, and then King Isanavaraman the second, who is the younger brother of previous king, and the last one, King Chayavaraman the fourth who was ruling between 921 to 942. According to Kocha, Chaya Varaman IV was a Lord of King, a wealthy and a successful warrior who became king through marriage to a sister of King Yeso Varaman I. Here is the Chaya Varaman IV genealogy according to my commentary. Side B of the inscription mentioned the name of Sakala Vindu as the teacher of those kings. There was Sakala Vindu who was the teacher of those kings and the best among their ministers 
He was rewarded by a large number of learned men. We found that Sakala Windu has served three previous king and had no problems with Jayavaraman the fourth showing the an interruption of his career. And his career is really last long, around 50 years. And then another very important verse is verse number 40. He being well versus in various size, namely grammar and so on, was honored by Siri of learned men. He brought about the prosperity of the Devaraja cult and was, as is will, another for Brihaspati. Then the last verse tells that the author of inscription was Sadasiva. In spite of the fact that his nephew named Sadasiva, imitating the nose, tie his fame with letters. He still ran to different directions with those letters. This Tarsiva is identified as the Tarsiva of Dabakum inscription here 235. As we can see that the area of corporate is in Menche province, just only 20 kilometers from Stockholm Temple and around 20 kilometers from Bhaktechama Temple and is around 120 kilometers to uh, the Angkor Complex or Yasotharapura, the capital at the time. It is on the Western historic route to Angkor. And this really coincide with the information from the provincial department of culture and fine arts that in 2019 had discovered 200 ancient sites in the province they were mostly built between 9 to 11th century from the work of Lolin Plummer Briggs he gave the genealogy and successor of many Sivacharya, such as from the inscription of Sadakakum, the inscription of Dakel, and inscription of Bhaktivedi. If we focus to the reign of King Chayavaraman IV, we can see many Sivacharya had serving this king, such as Isanamurti and Atama Shiva, and another one is Shiva Jaraya of Bhattekadai. Some may identify this Sakala Vintu as the Shiva Jaraya of Bhattekadai, but the problem is this Shiva Jaraya of Bhattekadai inscription have served uh, many kings after the uh, reign of Tayavaraman the fourth. So the best way we should keep another line uh, to this chart at the Sagala we do have served many kings starting from Yasavaraman the first, Harasavaraman the first, and Isanavaraman the second, and lastly, uh, King Chayavaraman the fourth. And his nephew is Sudasiva. Uh, showing that Sadasiva uh, have a strong influence the, from many members of his family that served Devaracha. Note that uh, the name ending in Vindu were given to Brahmins regularly in the pre Angkorian period. And this name started being used after the reign of King Surya Varaman the first. So Mokun, thank you. Thank you very much. My turned on. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Utain, for your 
interesting presentation. Does anyone have a question for Otain or would you like to contribute any comments? Oh, Seems pretty clear. Know. Dr. Otain, <laughs> is there anything you would like to add to your presentation, to your video? Uh, Yes, uh, actually, uh, to identify this Calavin 2 is uh, uh, really difficult and need more research about the uh, inscription because it seems that uh, this Tasiwa composed this inscription before the time of uh, Sadakakum. This means uh, before he became the important priest. So, uh, we can see the uh, also the development of the style of uh, Sadasiva, the maybe the most important Brahmin during the Angkorian period. Okay, does and, anyone have a question? I think this one is interesting, Dr. Utain, because of the specific reference to the Devo Raja cult. Um, I yes. think there's still some debate about that. And so you mentioning that this being a fairly recent find, um, I think the data from this inscription probably won't have been included in earlier discussions about the Devo Raja cult. And so they may, that may be something interesting to look at moving forward. For those of you who don't know Dr. Utain very well, um, towards the end of his lecture, he made an interesting note about Wintu being a name ending, which was uh, which stopped being used after the reign of Surya Varman I. Uh, if you're interested in names and in inscriptions, uh, Dr. Utain's PhD thesis focused specifically on um, Sanskrit names and inscriptions. So if you want to learn more about that, you can follow up with him on that. And uh, one more offer, are there any questions or comments? Okay, very clear. Um, in this case, it looks like we're a little bit ahead of schedule. We are set now for a break, so we will stop for about 10 minutes. Uh, it's not necessary to log off. You can just turn off your microphone and your video if you want, and we will commence again in about 10 minutes. Thank you. Okay, uh, so everyone, welcome back again. And our next lecture will be given by Dr. Gregory Kurilski on the topic, what do we talk about when we talk about inscriptions? So Gregory, please take the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Hunter. So, yeah, so the question I would like to address today may, be a bit, may seem a bit trivial. So what exactly uh, are we talking about when we talk about epigraphy or inscriptions? What does specifically uh, characterize an inscription with regards to other kinds of writings, such as manuscripts or books or, or other? Uh, could you see the, the images now, the, my PowerPoint? Not I yet. I do not see it. Not yet. Please wait a moment. I, I need to share. Oh, sorry. I need to share. Yes. I can do that. Just wait. Uh, okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, please uh, go ahead. Okay. Sorry, because in Laos, the, the connection is not always a, a nice. So, uh, so far, uh, academic disciplines that aim to study written sources have been divided according to the material a text is uh, written on. So writing on slabs or objects are assigned to epigraphy. Uh, writing some paper on manuscript or on leaf, whatever, to uh, philology, and other kind of writings such as tattoos and writing on, on, on bodies to anthropology. So this division of labor is apparently done regardless textual content. So like here, the same text can be found written on different media. But this is also the case for uh, inscription, for instance, the very famous Kalyan inscriptions in Burma, which also exist in a manuscript uh, form. Uh, sorry, uh, is there... Michel told me that uh, you yeah, cannot see the, the It's the, not appearing full screen. Yes, that's correct, Dr. Korilski. Uh, I wanted to interrupt you as well. Okay, sorry, just, just I will do something. I will just unplug the screen. It would be better like this. So I think okay. it's okay now. Yeah, it's okay. much better. Okay, yeah. <laughs> sorry for that. Uh, yes, I was saying that the, the famous Kalyan inscription in Burma also exists in a manuscript uh, uh, form. And just to give another example, the Treaty of Demarcation between the kingdoms of Ayutthaya and Vientiane was also recorded on both stone and palm leaf manuscript. A somewhat extreme case is sets of tipitaka that are inscribed on stone or wood, such as the Stella of Kutodo Pagoda in Burma, 
uh, the blocks buried in the caves of uh, Mount Qijing in China, or uh, even the wooden boards containing the Tripitaka Koreana. So one may ask uh, whether or not such writings must pertinently be considered as inscriptions. Uh, there are moreover a number of writings that appear on support or media that crisscross these broad categories. This well-known golden manuscript of the pure civilization exemplifies the blurred and sometimes artificial boundary that is drawn between inscriptions and other writings. Uh, comparable to that are Supanabat, that is inscribed golden leaves that are found in several parts of Thailand and elsewhere. So the question arises: what does define an inscription? The very term inscription has a Latin uh, etymology, inscriptio, which literally means the act of writing on. As for the term epigraph, it has a Greek origin, which also literally means written on or written on uh, something. So we can see that both Greek and Latin etymologies do not help much as every manifestation of writing actually implies writing on something. Admittedly, most European dictionaries give a more narrow definition and consider epigraphy as the study of writings made on durable or imperishable materials, such as stone, clay, or metal. It is in this restricted sense that the term epigraphy is usually understood in academic circles. But is durability really a relevant criterion for characteriz characterizing inscriptions? This is apparently the opinion of medievalist uh, Robert Favreau, sorry, uh, who suggests the function of the epigraphy is related to the memory of events. It is also what suggests the title of a recent uh, edited book that you probably know on epigraphy of Southeast Asia, which is actually a very good publication. But is uh, writing for eternity the main raison d'être of epigraphy? I argue uh, that it is not, or at least not always. First, because uh, durability is any case relative. What does eternity or even a longer time really mean? One millennium, one century, one decade? In Southeast Asia, there is indeed a number of inscriptions in which the intention to last for a longer period is explicit. Regularly mentioned is the duration of 5,000 years, which is the date given in the Pali commentaries of the duration of the teachings of, of the Buddha from the Buddha's death. However, this cannot be considered as specific to the inscriptions as the mention of 5,000 years, for instance, also very often appear manuscript colorful. A second counter argument against durability as a distinctive feature of inscriptions is the fact that some of them are found written on a material whose imperishable nature is not obvious, such as wood, uh, walls, or even leather or cloth. On the other hand, some material used for manuscript writings can last for centuries as well. The most ancient Pali fragment from in Kizil Cave in China uh, are dated to about the second century of uh, the present era, and some Nepalese Sanskrit and Pali manuscripts go back as far as the ninth century. Not all inscriptions, unfortunately, last so long. Mention must also be made of inscriptions that are temporarily installed and which are meant to be removed, erased, or amended, as the case in ancient Rome with wooden or wax tablets containing lists of jury, for instance, of band citizen, draft law, etc. Uh, on the right uh, uh, side of the picture, there is an example in the Cambodian, uh, Cambodian epigraphic corpus uh, with these legal inscriptions, which includes a list that, uh, where some items have been purposely erased. So although there are certain inscriptions that are lasting and which are meant to be so, many others are not. Therefore, durability cannot be regarded as a characteristic or distinctive feature of inscription. Alternatively, we can understand the word inscription as a specific technique of writing, namely the subtractive technique, whereby material is removed from the surface by incision or engraving, as opposed to additive technique as ink or painting. The truth is this criterion appears as not relevant as writings on murals or rocks are normally considered as inscriptions, although being written in with an additive technique. On the other hand, palm leaf manuscripts are written with a subtractive technique as they are engraved in or inscribed on the leaves. So technically speaking, palm leaf manuscripts are inscriptions. Therefore, inscriptions cannot be defined on the basis of a specific uh, writing technique. Some specialists of other cultural areas who question the sense of epigraphy have argued that the exposition, the display of writing is a decisive feature to define an inscription. 
The purpose of many stone inscriptions is indeed to be seen by the population, which make them public text. Among them are royal edicts, laws, and agreements for which the place of the installation was chosen according to visibility. An example is the Miezadi inscription in Burma, written in four different languages, which is believed to have been placed at a site that was visible from boatmen coming from abroad when they landed at Pagan from the Irrawaddy River. In some instances, the, the location where the inscription was installed is indicated in the inscription itself, like this law promulgated in Atsukotai, uh, are said to have been placed at the very center of the world city. I'll give you just another example of an inscription of uh, Lamna in Northern Thailand, which states uh, the inscription was left near the main Buddha statue in a monastery, so obviously at a, a significant uh, place. However, the fact that epigraphs are exposed uh, do, does not mean that they are always meant to be read or understood. One may ask indeed, what was the proportion of the population who was able to read inscriptions? Of course, this depends on time and location, but even though literacy gradually expanded, the discrepancy between the level of literacy on population and that of the style and content of epigraph, which may include Sanskrit and Pali loan word, uh, Indic concept, technical terms, etc., this gap must have remained considerable. As for texts that are entirely written in Pali or Sanskrit and follow the complex rules of metrics or caveat, it is obvious that their degree of visibility does not correspond to their degree of readability. We can even go further by suggesting that sometimes inscriptions were meant not to be understood by the masses. The meaning of some epigraphs, among which are yantra, was intentionally kept obscure and unintelligible to the commoner. The same can probably be said for dates which are often given by means of highly complex and technical astronomical details. Their primary purpose was not so much to provide positive information on, on the, the date of an event, uh, which is certainly useful for the present day historians, but rather to demonstrate the ruler's ability to choose an auspicious time for this very event. As in India and other places in the world, the capacity of the monarch and his court to accurately reading in the stars and planets was a guarantee for the prosperity of the kingdom. Then, inscriptions can be regarded as a manifestation of symbolic power and not only as a conveyor of positive information. In this connection, some specialists argue that the very purpose of inscriptions is to be more visible than read. In Babylon and Rome, for instance, laws were displayed in many places in the city. However, the aim of such public exposition was not so much laws to be read by the population, but rather to make laws physically present in the city. This amounts to say the presence of exposed writing in a given society may be more related to the image the writing has in this society than to the level of literacy among the population. This is certainly an appealing argument, argument and the number of inscriptions in Southeast Asia support this hypothesis. However, the fact is we also find inscriptions that were obviously set in order to remain invisible. This small inscription that was placed within the model of Vihara in Chengsen, northern Thailand, is an example of an epigraph that was intentionally made not visible. This phenomenon is even more obvious in the case of texts inscribed on gold or silver leaves that are buried on the Buddha's foundation or enshrined into Chetiyas or Buddha images. Therefore, the criterion of visibility is not more decisive than that of readability in defining what an inscription is. Acknowledging that inscriptions are not always meant to be read or understood and even to be seen, we can consider they have a function of communication. This communication, however, is not limited to the literal content of an inscription, but recovers other dimension. There is, for instance, a ritual dimension as the installation of an inscription usually goes with a ceremony and ritual performance. Furthermore, the presence of an inscription in the public space may also entail specific behavior from the people facing it. For instance, it was the custom in antique Rome, as well as in medieval France, to read aloud epitaph inscribed on funerary uh, monuments when passing by. In Southeast Asia, inscribed stones are most often incorporated within a religious site or framework and are therefore an object of devotion. This entails the faithful to kneel and to bow down before the inscriptions and eventually to recite dedicated formula. Some inscriptions also explicitly urge readers to respect or take care of the stone and not to destroy or displace it. This highlights the fact that uh, an inscription is not only a text 
but an object that had a specific function in the social life. The truth is scholars and epigraphic studies actually most often consider inscribed text rather than inscription per se. The common use of ribbings, uh, very useful, but exemplifies both the emphasis placed on text and the relegation on the media. As a matter of fact, inscriptions include many other significant, significant elements beside the inscribed text per se, such as figures, reliefs, design elements, decorations, flourishes, and so forth. The graphical organization of the letters, including paragraph, registers, postscript, paratext, annexes, etc., has also significance. These elements are called ordinatio by French historian Jean Malon. In addition, majority of inscription in Southeast Asia have a specific shape, namely the form of what one usually calls, to my opinion, improperly, bisema. This stereotype shape makes the inscription immediately recognizable and identifiable as an inscription, even if one is not in a position or in capacity to read it. Thus, inscriptions combine both a linguistic message and an iconic message, which pertain to what Roland Barthes called a rhetoric of image. Here we can refer to Umberto Eco's work on the semiotic of architecture, in which he demonstrated that architectural objects are expressions that convey functional and social content. According to Eco, architecture can therefore be considered and studied as a system of signs and significations. For example, a staircase denotes its function by its very form and can also connote the rank or function of the person using it. For instance, a ceremonial staircase or a preaching uh, chair staircase. So as an object that occupies a specific place in the environment, I believe inscriptions should be studied in the light of this semiotic perspective. In this short presentation, I have shown that features as durability, visibility, readability, and so forth are not really relevant to define what an inscription is, neither to determine what is specific to inscriptions. Of course, I do not pretend to be able to answer this complex question, but I argue that to examine an epigraph only in its literal dimension amounts to overlook a significant part of its meaning. I suggest an inscription should be examined also in its material dimension. Indeed, its uh, signification can be fully grasped only by considering the relationship that exists between the in inscribed text and its topological situation. This uh, aspect has been so far neglected in the academic uh, research. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for a very informative um, presentation, Dr. Gregory. Uh, does anyone have a question for him now or a comment? Uh, yes, I would like to give some information about the uh, uh, belief in uh, particularly in, in Thailand. Uh, in, in the Buddha image, many times we found that inside inside the Buddha image, uh, they have uh, contained some inscription. So it's a really contrast to the thing you, you, you just mentioned, the exposition. Uh, uh, in, in the Thai tradition, we, we call it the heart of the Buddha. We make inscription and then put inside the Buddha image. In this case, uh, basically the people cannot see that inscription. So uh, I think uh, this inscription cannot be functioned as the communication. Uh, so uh, I just add uh, some uh, information for you. And uh, it's also, let me think about uh, uh, some, some place in Northern India and Pakistan like you get that the uh, very ancient manuscript uh, were uh, contained inside the ancient pagoda. So uh, in this case, uh, uh, this manuscript and inscription are considered as like a reading. Uh, do you agree with this uh, idea or not? I, um, I, 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 let's go ahead, Gregory. Yeah, yeah. Actually, um, maybe I'll talk too fast because it's exactly what I said. I mean, I show some images of inscriptions that were hidden 
BNF Buddha statue. So, and I say at the end of my talk that communicability is not the main criterion. So I'm completely aware what you what, what you say. But what I maintain is the, the link between the inscription and where it is uh, put, the location of the inscription is, is significant, is just what I mean. Whatever it is visible or not. Dr. Sombat, were you going to contribute something? I see your microphone was on, I wasn't sure. I know. Um, Gregory, following up on, on Dr. Utain's comment, um, I can think of other examples, because uh, it, it kind of struck me how you were talking about whether an inscription is somewhere where it can publicly be read or not. And I think uh, Utain was mentioning how sometimes on Buddha images, the actual written message is hidden, so you can't, you can't see it. And I can think of a specific example in, in Cambodia, I've seen a bronze Buddha image, which dates, I think, to about the 12th century. And the image of the Buddha is seated on a, like a pedestal. And the Buddha image, the, the Buddha is bronze and the pedestal is bronze, but they're separate pieces. And if you lift the Buddha image, the inscription is actually underneath where the Buddha sits. So it's completely not visible. And so, yeah, it is, it's true that you mean that all of these factors, none of them are a, a direct indication of what an inscription is. And they're all kind of different considerations we need to think about. I like your point about subtractive versus additive. Um, there are, for example, in Thailand, some clay Buddha um, tablets which have red ink writing on the back of them. And when I first looked at them, I debated, should, should these be treated as inscriptions or should they not? And, and I decided to include them because I figure that uh, as epigraphers, if we don't include those, people who study manuscripts are not going to look at those objects. And so the, there are a lot of things to think about in, in the context of what an inscription is and, and how we define an inscription, I think. Does anyone else have a question for, for Gregory or any other comments? Okay, if there are none, we will proceed on. Our next presentation will be given, it's uh, co-presented by uh, Dr. Sombat Mengmi Suksiri and uh, Dr. Gangwon Kachima. And uh, since there are two of them, Dr. Sombat will be presenting. And the title of their presentation is, Is Tawarawadi Present? Dr. Sombat? Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Hunter. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my, our paper, I and Dr. Kangwon Kachima, but only me, uh, will be the presenter for today. Uh, my paper, our paper is, is the Warawati uh, present and evidence from recently did, uh, discover what Prangam inscription. So I would like to bring you all to this. Uh, before my presentation, I would like to thank my professor, my teacher, assistant professor Jirapat Propanvitiya fellow Royal Society of Thailand and a member of steering committee, Sanskrit Study Center, Silpakorn University for uh, inspiring us, both of us to write this article. Uh, my topic, our topic uh, to, for the presentation, we have three topics. The first one is Dawarawati in Wat Pangam inscription. And the second one is Saradu Ravikridita as the crucial Sanskrit meter in the inscription all over Southeast Asian uh, countries. And the third one is Dimiringa among vocabulary uh, or indigenous vocabulary in Sanskrit poetry in Wat Prangam inscription. I go to the first topics, Dawarwati in Wat Prangam inscription. Uh, Dawarwati was Krishna ideal city in the Mahabharata, India's great epics, since Southeast Asia is heavily influenced by Indian culture. Several Indian cultural influences have persisted to the present day, such as naming their city after the magnificent city of Dawarwati. However, due to a lack of educate evidence 
the precise location of the Warwati in this region cannot be, uh, cannot be specified. Uh, recent excavation at Wat Prangam, located in Wat or Monastery Prangam, Mueang District, Nakhon Patom Province, Thailand, revealed an inscription. The inscription was carved on the sandstone slab using Pallava or Brahmi script that had never been seen before in Southeast Asia. Uh, some of Thai epigraphists refer to the script as balloon script due to their resemblance to balloons. Uh, apart from the unique scripts, the inscriptions contained, which refer to the ideal city of the Varavati, is also noteworthy. Perhaps the inscription is one of the evidences establishing the location of the Varavati, whether as a city or as a state. Uh, our presentation is just the preliminary study and focuses on the Sanskrit, and we have studied inscription from uh, our Sanskrit perspective, uh, perspective. I would like to show the photo of the uh, excavation site at Wat Pranga uh, at that time, uh, two years back. Uh, this location is very near to the railroad, and this is the stone slab, sandstone slab that first uh, discovered at that time. And this is the fragment of the stone slab that we fixed together to make it complete like this. This is the Wat Prangam inscription, very, very interesting inscription, a very beautiful inscription in the term of the script. Uh, this, the details of inscription in uh, the recently published books. Uh, we, we just would like to distribute this book uh, next week. Uh, the script of this inscription is Brahmi or Pallava dynasty. The language of the inscription is Sanskrit. Uh, the date or the era of the inscription is the seventh century CE or seven or eighth century AD. Uh, about the meter, we can see the words. We have six verses. The first uh, was Malini, the second, the fourth, and the fifth, the sixth, uh, Saradura Vikridita. This is the crucial meter in this inscription. I would like to uh, show you in the next topic. This uh, inscription already translated into Thai and into English and published in this book, Selected uh, select Sanskrit Inscription in India and Southeast Asia, Volume 1, uh, for, be the, for being the felicitation volume in the auspicious occasion of 80th birth anniversary of Assistant Professor Chirapat Prapanditya. So I would like to bring you to the script. This is the Sarudu Vikridita, the fifth word of the inscription. It reads Sri Yanam Dimirinkam, but uh, let me check this one. Sri Yanam Dimirinkam Apati Puram Sa Hastina Kaya Puri. This, this is a crucial words and uh, also the indigenous, uh, indigenous language that I uh, assume that it should be the more language. So this, uh, this word is not a complete one because the broken uh, fragment from this slab. Uh, there are six verses in this inscription. I, I would like to skip, but uh, I would like to show you the crucial words that is the second word in Saradu Vikredita and the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth words are in Saradu Vikredita meter. Uh, out of six, four are in Saradu Vikredita meter. That is the most important thing I would like to tell uh, you today.
the translation, I would like to go to the first uh, words. The translation of these words, first, when we make the translation with uh, Professor Chirapat and with Dr. Kang Won, Dr. Uten, we uh, uh, suppose, uh, we, we assume that these words uh, it's the invocation for the uh, Vishnu, Lord Vishnu. But uh, some of us has opinion that, oh, this, the words, it's a eulogy of the king. So finally, I would like to show you with the uh, comparison with the Arthur inscription all over Southeast Asia, uh, what this word should be, invocation or the eulogy of the kings. So uh, I come to the second topic that Saradu Vikridita as the crucial Sanskrit meter in inscription on our Southeast Asia. Uh, first, I would like to bring you to Vietnam. Since uh, we are the student of uh, Sanskrit and epigraphy, so we would like to uh, refer to the inscription. The first inscription in Vietnam is Wokan inscription. Uh, it's the date back to 8th to 9th century BE or the 2nd and the 3rd century CE. Uh, in this inscription, I would like to bring you to uh, the meter. You see, uh, even it's not quite uh, readable, it's illegible, uh, some, only some part is uh, readable. But we have seen the meter of this inscription, inscription, very, very important. That is Wasanta Tilaka meter for one word. And another word is in Saradu Vikridita. I, I show you this meter in Saradu Vikridita in Wokan inscription in Vietnam. Saradu Vikridita. Uh, that's very, very uh, important meter in Southeast Asia. And I bring you to the another inscription in Lao PDR, that is the Wat Pu inscription of King Chai Varaman the first, or K367. Uh, the inscription also in Parnava script, language is in Sanskrit and the date uh, is six or seven century CE. You can see all verses are in Saradu Vikridita. You can see the date and the language and the script are quite say, are the same. And the verses are in Saradu Vikridita. This is very, very important for the comparison between the, the Wat Prangam inscription and uh, Arthur inscription all over Southeast Asia. This Saradu Vikridita in uh, Wat Pu inscription. I will skip, and we also have the translation, but uh, since I have really uh, short time, so I will skip this uh, translation also. And in Cambodia, we also have the inscription in Saradu Vikridita uh, that it uh, have the same period, that is fifth or sixth century CE, uh, the inscription of Pramroe also include in our volume for our Professor Chirapat Prapanvitiya. Uh, the meter, you can see this meter for words 10 and 11 words, it's Saradu Vikridita. We can see the uh, meter and this meter, it's really, really uh, popular amongst the po 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 poetry, the poetry in Southeast Asia. And uh, one more thing for, from my observation, that is Saradu Vikridita uh, from the term of Sanskrit uh, poetry. Uh, they compose in passive voice, passive voice. And the word Maya always appear in those Saradu Vikridita meter. It's very, very important, very interesting uh, information from this inscription. And in Indonesia also, we do have the Sanskrit inscription that is Changkal inscription. Also, we have Saradru Vikridita, uh, verse first and second, 
four to seven, the fifth, uh, 12 words. This very, very interesting information about the Saradu Wiki data. Also, you can see the uh, words here and the uh, passive voice is here. Also, oh, okay, I, I will skip it. So another inscription, even in Thailand, in the Southern Thailand, uh, the Wat Mahe Yung inscription in the Konsi Tamarat province. Uh, we have Sanskrit and Brahmi Palawa script. Uh, the uh, period or the date, it's 7th and 8th century CE. Uh, and we have Saradu Vikridita was for five verses. This is the rubber, uh, rubbing, sorry, the rubbing of the inscription. We try to uh, read it, but it's uh, some can read. So this is the very important meter in this in in those inscriptions. So I would like to uh, suggest that what Prangam inscription may be uh, in the same uh, period with this with those inscription all over Southeast Asian country. And for for the last topic. Dimirinka or the Mon vocabulary Sanskrit in Sanskrit poetry. I would like uh, to show you that. Uh, what Prangam inscription was discovered in 2020? The Palawa characters on the stone slab, according to the famous Thai epigraphist, are the most beautiful script, as I told you, uh, ever discovered in Southeast Asia. The script have a very distinctive style with long lower stroke and a volume like upper stroke. The most significant information contained in this inscription is the name of the meteorological city of the Varavati, the beautiful city of Krishna, Avishnu Avatara. Since more than a century, researchers have attempted to pinpoint the exact location of the ancient city of the Varavati, which may be anywhere in the middle region of the modern Thailand but have been unable to do so until uh, 2020 CE. This inscription was discovered in the mid of the year uh, 2020 and contained the name of Tawarwati and Hastinapura as well as a strange city called Dimirinka because this word has no meaning in Sanskrit. Even though it appears in the Sanskrit stanza, we presume it was the indigenous name in that distant period. It may be a modern term, but it was Sanskritized in accordance with the meter composition rule. Finally, the translators, it means we, Professor Chirapat, me and Dr. Uten, conclude that the term Dimirinka may originate from the modern word Damring or in modern uses, Demrian, which means thunder. According to the Sanskrit verses on the slab, the city of Dimiringa, Thunder, was identical to Dwaravati and Hastinapura. This is the fresh information green from what Prangam inscription that may aid in determining the original name of the Thailand's present day Nakonpatom province. Additionally, the inscription lists supply and animal donated to God Shiva's sanctuary. This revelation informs Gora, who previously considered that only Buddhism exists in ancient Dwaravati, Thailand, and not Hinduism. As a reason, this inscription is the most intercruing of the 30 included in this edition. I mean, the uh, felicitation volume of Professor Chirapat Prapanvitiya. Uh, yes, I would like to show you this the, the word uh, Dimiringam. Uh, Apartipuram and uh, Saradu Vikridita, and this the uh, Mon, uh, Mon language in the present use, Damring or Demrian, the pronunciation like that. This, this is my uh, observation from the Wat Prangam inscription. Thank you for your kind attention. Dr. Sombat, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, does anyone have a question or a comment to contribute? Uh, yes, I would like to ask Professor Sombat, 
uh, about the Saradu Vikridita uh, in in uh, in India inscription. This kind of matter is available or not? Because yeah, uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Let's yeah, it's ahead. available. Yeah, it's available from uh, the. Uh, I I think uh, the uh around one or two uh century uh, before uh B bc before the Christ, uh, common era uh, we can see we, we have seen it in the inscription of the kupta period that is the sarad also saradu wikirita meter we can see Dr. Sombat, I would like to ask with regard to the felicitation volume for Dr. Jirapat, for those who are yeah. interested, how can they obtain a copy? Uh, uh, next week, it will be contributed <laughs> for, for all who are interested. We published for uh, 2,500 copies, so <laughs> we can distribute to all of you. If you are interested, you just uh, give us and uh, your your address or you come to our center sanskrit studies center silpakon university we can uh, provide you this copy this the uh, volume is for the uh, 80th birth anniversary of professor chirapat propanvitiya in his uh, birth anniversary Okay, so maybe I can get some additional information from Dr. Sombat. And for those who are unable to go to Bangkok and the Sanskrit Study Center, but would like a, a copy, um, we can uh, arrange information on how you can get a copy of that. Uh, does anyone else have a question or a comment to contribute to Dr. Sombat and Dr. Gangwon? Uh, yes, uh, one, one, one more. Uh, I, I would like to ask uh, why does scholar of Soviet Asia prefer this kind of uh, matter? Because uh, it's quite really difficult. It's not just common like uh, Anustup. Uh, there is uh, any reason behind the uh, using of this kind of matter to compose the Sanskrit inscription? Yeah, thank you for your good. Uh, question, Chan Uten, because uh, I, I I missed something in my presentation. Uh, I also uh, always ask myself that why they use uh, a lot of Saradru Vikridita meter. So uh, in my opinion, I, I uh, have the, my con my own conclusion that maybe they are from the same uh, same group from South Indian. Uh, from South India, and they are from the same school of Sanskrit language, because uh, the person who can learn Sanskrit, they are they are only Brahmins, right? Can learn Sanskrit, and they can compose uh, Sanskrit poetry really well like this. Uh, Saradruvikridita has uh, nineteen syllables, more syllables, more difficult. So the uh, Sarudruvi Kiridita, very, very popular in Southeast Asia uh, during the 7th and 8th century CE. Uh, this is the, uh, I think this is the concrete evidence that uh, they have some uh, unseen connection between them, between the people in this area, I mean in Southeast Asia when we connect them with this uh, Sanskrit meter, especially Saradruvikirita, we have found in many, many inscriptions in Vietnam, in Laos, in Cambodia, in Thailand, even in Indonesia. And uh, they, they have really, very really, uh, similar uh, similarity and the coincidence like this, we have to study more. Dr. Peter Skilling, you can go ahead. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Am I? Okay, uh, going back to India, John. Um, first of all, I think Shadur Vikridita is not easy to 
compose? Mm. Uh, that's just a small question. And secondly, it, I think it's used in, in Prakrit and Pali as well. Is that correct? And are there examples of Shadula Pirita in the, in the Pali compositions and the Prakrit mm. compositions? Dr. Sombat, did you hear his question? Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I can hear this. Yeah, please. Dr. Skilling, could you Thank please you. repeat a little louder? Uh, let me check. Yeah. Are there examples of Shadura Vikridita in Pali Kavya and in Prakrit Kavya as well? Oh, uh, in Pali and in Prakrit. I'm sorry, I have only a little knowledge about this. Uh, even I, I study Pali and I uh, learned the uh, Pali poetry, but as far as I know, uh, Professor uh, Skilling, uh, only few few uh, poets can uh, compose this meter. Uh, in, in, in Pali, we call Satunla Vikridita. It's quite similar, they're, they're the same. Satula wiki dita chan. It's like a saradura wiki dita, same meaning. So uh, in Thailand, you know, for, for, from my experience, I studied Pali for nine years. Uh, we never composed this meter at all because it's very, very difficult for us. So I, I'm not sure that uh, in this, uh, in Prakrit, I'm not sure, in Pali, I, I'm also not sure that. Uh, some any person can compose this or not, but it's still there. It's still in Pali, uh, compo composition, uh, poetry composition text, uh, like a wood Thai or some 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 uh, text. The Satula Vikirita Chan is there. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, are there any other questions or comments? Okay, Dr. Sombat, Dr. Gongwon, thank you very much. Um, next up is myself, um, and I'll be speaking about the complexity of typology and labels. So just allow me to open my PowerPoint here. And okay, so today um, the title of my talk is The Complexity of Typology and Labels for Ancient Scripts in Mainland Southeast Asia. For those of you who don't know me, I'm currently a PhD candidate at the National University of Singapore. And I'm also a research fellow at the Center for Khmer Studies in Siem Reap. So I'm currently working on my PhD dissertation. And um, my topic is a study of cultural adaptation on the Karat Plateau, specifically in the uh, late first millennium. Um, my main research material is inscriptions. And I'm specifically looking at script development and how this might inform us about cultural relations on the Karat Plateau. My temporal scope extends from the earliest inscriptions in Southeast Asia until about the 13th century. And my spatial scope includes Thailand, Cambodia, and Laos. So um, today I'm speaking a bit about script categories and script labels, which are um, complicated for a variety of reasons. And I think most of you would already agree with that statement. So um, some scholars argue that the labels are unsuitable because they may be misleading or they may um, draw on connections which aren't actually there. Um, and also some of these script labels might have an effect on how we contextualize uh, one inscription with relation to other artifacts and other sites. So why is this relevant? Um, I think that the current labels we use are somewhat temporally restrictive. Um, and by that, I mean that we take the current script typology that we use for Southeast Asia, we bound them to specific centuries. And so then when we find an example of an inscription which is undated, we, we almost immediately group it in with one of these categories and we thus date it based on that. And I think this could be problematic because for example, in Cambodia, a lot of inscriptions have dates, but in Thailand, for example, a lot of inscriptions don't have dates. And so we date those inscriptions paleographically based on the, the style of the script. And so if there are any irregularities with regards to the script style, it can cause us to assign an inscription to the wrong century. 
Um, I think these labels can also affect the interpretation. And that's because these uh, categories that we already have are kind of loaded in meaning. And so when we take an inscription and assign it to a specific category, there are implications which we automatically place on that inscription before we've even studied it. And I think that there have also been very few challenges to our traditional uh, categories, which um, may be worth considering because there may be other script types we haven't recognized uh, and there may be discrepancies in the chronology of it. So um, I'm not yet completed with my research topic. And for my presentation today, I'm not trying to argue that the script categories we use are wrong or inaccurate. I'm just trying to draw attention to how they can have uh, complexity, which can affect the way we uh, interpret inscriptions. So the common typology for early inscriptions in Southeast Asia, of course, you're familiar, like Pallava, uh, Post Pallava, Old Khmer, Old Mon, et cetera. Um, I should give a caveat to this. Uh, the earliest inscribed artifacts we find in mainland Southeast Asia are often these small intaglios, which are written in a script, which looks more like the Gupta style script. But we don't often talk about these when we talk about early inscriptions in Southeast Asia. There are very few of these. They tend to be very short and have uh, very little con content. Uh, there's also some debate on whether these were actually produced in Southeast Asia by locals or were these perhaps brought here by people from India. So we'll skip over that for now. The traditional view of scripts in the region, we look at the Pallava, Post Pallava, Old Khmer, and Old Mon, and these are typically assigned to a set um, centuries, as I mentioned. So then when we look at an inscription, we look at the script, we kind of pigeonhole it into one of these categories, and we assume that it fits temporally within that category. For Old Khmer, there's also a further distinction between the 9th and the 12th century. There's kind of a, a continuous evolution of the script style. So I think that the script styles deserve reconsideration. Um, for one thing uh, is the paleographic dating aspect. So relative dating. Inscriptions are often dated relatively based on the style of, of the script. Uh, and also sometimes objects like a Buddha image or even a temple. If there's no date that we have associated with that artifact or with that location, uh, other art historians and uh, archaeologists often date um, sites and objects based on the recommendations made by paleographers. And our dating is kind of not very secure because it's a relative dating. And so I want to mention uh, Dr. Peter Skilling here. He's kind of been influential in the ways that I address this issue. Peter has noted, for example, that Pallava and Post Pallava are misleading because, for example, we don't have... Um, enough evidence to say that there was direct political um, control from the Pallava dynasty of, of South India or even how involved they were with Southeast Asia. And also because when we talk about Pallava script in Southeast Asia, there was also Pallava script in South in uh, Southern India. And so it's kind of like we're using that same name to describe two different script styles in two different parts of the continent which have different uh, evolutionary tracks. And so that can cause problems. And I know for most of us who study inscriptions, we realize that, for example, Pallava, it has um, some implications which deserve a little uh, consideration or maybe a caveat. But for other people who don't study inscriptions, when they come and they read about the history and culture of ancient Southeast Asia, they can be easily confused by the usage of these terms. Peter has also mentioned how um, pre and Korean is used in, in early text referring to Cambodian inscriptions. And so there's not like one single unified uh, title or label that we use for these scripts. On top of this, there's been a lot of new archaeological discoveries made in recent decades, and there's also been advances in archaeological theories. And so with these new advances and all the new inscriptions we have found, really, we should go back and reassess the script categorization. But despite this, it hasn't really been done yet. And the traditional categories, categories are still very prominent, and they get repeated in the literature. And I think this further reinforces the paradigm because the more that people reference these same script styles in the same centuries, it's kind of like solidifying it in the literature for readers, they're more convinced that these are historically accurate. So maybe these categories are accurate or maybe they're not. And that's why this deserves reassessment. So a quick uh, look at my methodological approach. Um, I'm working now, I have a background in, in epigraphy and I'm also working now in historical archeology. span uh, in, in archaeology, prior to the 1960s, cultural history was the primary research methodology that scholars used. And then following the 
1960s, this shifted to processual archaeology, and then later post-processual archaeology also arose as a competing theory. And I'll focus here on cultural history and processual archaeology. And this is because the early scholars working on inscriptions in Southeast Asia, like the colonial era archaeologists and historians, they were all working within the cultural historical method. Um, for my research project, I've adopted the processual method, which is why I will mention it briefly here also. The cultural historical approach prominent in the work of, for example, George Ceres, it um, was an approach where they brought artifacts together and then divided them based on styles and materials. And then they used that to e extrapolate periods, which were often you know, promoted as like historical periods and assigned to specific centuries. And then different features, for example, the art, art history, the archeology span and the scripts were all tied together and associated with these categories. And so, for example, in Cambodia, we know there's the pre-Angkorian, Angkorian and post-Angkorian periods and categorization. For Thailand, we have Tawarawadi Srivijaya uh, and Lopburi. Um, for the processual approach, uh, in my studies, I have taken the processual archaeology approach, which is more of a systematic analysis. So I'm reassessing available data and including newly included inscriptions which haven't been studied before. Uh, and I'm also assessing the validity of traditional claims, and I'm looking at alternative factors which may have influenced script development. Um, and I'm looking for interconnectivity throughout the region. Uh, a key point of the processual archaeology is a rejection of the stadial model. So the stadial model is very common for uh, cultural historical studies, and the stadial model kind of views that things were stagnant for a long period of time, and then in a very short period, there was kind of these abrupt changes. And so to frame this, for example, we think of Pallava is for a certain century, and then all of a sudden, we have this transition to post-Pallava, and then post-Pallava was used for maybe two or three centuries, and then we have this abrupt change to Old Khmer. And processual archaeology would say that this doesn't seem natural. You know, it would seem more logical that uh, through time across the centuries, there was probably more of a gradual and continual change or evolution rather than like stagnation and then an abrupt change, unless there's some reason why we would think that there's some sort of abrupt change like this. Another important difference between cultural history and processual archaeology is that cultural historians tend to attribute the spread uh, of cultural traits to things like uh, diffusion, migration, and war. And so, for example, they think, oh, this culture began like this, and then they expanded, and then some other one uh, invaded, and they collapsed, and something like this. And these sorts of theories are kind of a little bit outdated. Uh, processual archaeology doesn't tend to favor such theories, instead looking to a diversity of factors, such as geography, environment, economy, sociological preferences, etc. So looking back, the early scripts in India um, are all, all derived from the Brahmi script, which by the early century CE had begun to uh, show variations. And by about the sixth century, it had kind of evolved into new and distinct uh, categories. However, um, early epigraphers and paleographers working on India uh, disagreed about how to label these scripts and, and, and how to call them. And sometimes they labeled them following the kingdom, other times they labeled them following the geographic region. And there's still dispute in, in circles of uh, epigraphers working on Indian inscriptions on this topic. When we come to Southeast Asia, <clears throat> it seems um, that a lot of the early stone inscriptions had a relatively homogenous script style. And De Casperis, uh, at first he, he said this resembled the, uh, the Vengi script, but Vogel came back and disagreed in about, I think, 1918. Vogel said, no, they, they look more like the Pallava script. And then following Vogel, this became kind of most prominent in the literature. Um, but for example, Paul Lavian, our historian at Hawaii, uh, he studies uh, early like pre-Angkorian pre art in Cambodia, and he points that a lot of art historians draw a connection between early art in Cambodia with Pallava art, but he explains that actually this idea was based on the, the description of epigraphers that the script uses Pallava script, and so this kind of leads to a little bit of circular reasoning. It's like epigraphers say that the script is from Pallava, and so art historians say that the art is from Pallava, and then so epigraphers, we look back at the art historians and we say, if the art was Pallava, then that seems to reinforce our idea that the script was Pallava. And so it's kind of been widely accepted, <clears throat> excuse me, it's been widely accepted, but based on circular reason without a lot of criticism. 
So Sirkar argued that Pallava for Southeast Asia is incorrect. We should use late Brahmi. And Arlo Griffiths, for example, he prefers to use the label late Southern Brahmi. But De Casper still warns that we shouldn't diminish uh, the Pallava, the similarities of the Pallava, even though we don't know there's direct, direct political contact with Southeast Asia, the early scripts of Southeast Asia do quite closely resemble the script style of Pallava. So I want to mention here late Southern Brahmi, because this is something I noticed that even, um, even uh, Dr. Skilling has, has mentioned Brahmi, and a minute ago, even Sombat mentioned Brahmi. And I think uh, for me, I kind of debate which, which types of labels are more suitable. And so I see this tendency to go either too general or too specific. So too general, I mean, if we see slight variations in script style, but we decide to group them together into a large category with generalized feature, we tend to have a limited number of labels, like is what we have now, only a few labels. Whereas to be more, more specific would be to look at every little difference and then label each type as a specific script, script type. And that would result in many different script types, which is not necessarily advantageous to us. But the difference here is going too general, too general means there's less controversy. So when you use a name like late Southern Brahmi, it's not controversial. However, it's not that descriptive either. And so I give for an example for, for Western European languages like English, French, German, et cetera, uh, we tend to say that these are written in the Roman script or the Latin script. But for example, in between these languages, there are um, phonological differences. There's <clears throat> differences in pronunciation between these languages. There's difference in the way that we, um, we show these sounds and symbols. And so we can, for example, speak of an English script and a French script as being different, even though they're both based on the old Latin script. And so then we could ask, is the English writing system the same as French or German? Well, yes and no. Generally, it's the same as French and German in that it's based on Old Latin, but specifically it's not because French and German both have different symbols which are not represented in English and which um, are meant to represent different phonological sounds. So along the same sense, if we look at Old Khmer and we were to call it Late Southern Brahmi, is that correct? Yes, it's correct but it's not necessarily specific. And so if we're trying to hit at how script styles are different, it doesn't help because it's a little bit too general. When I think about this, um, I think it's also valuable to think rather than just talking about scripts, we can also talk about things like fonts or like call calligraphy. So script we think is like a writing system or a set of letters for a specific language. And a font is the different ways to show the letters in that language. Uh, calligraphy, or we might also say cursive writing, is more like artistic writing. And so, for example, uh, even today in, in your uh, computer programming, we have like various types of scripts which are different. You know, they look distinct, but these are all based on the Latin script, and we would all consider these the English script. And so, again, it kind of hits this point on script versus fonts. So Dr. Sombat had just mentioned the uh, Prangam inscription, which he said is uh, widely agreed to be the Pallava script, but he said that there's also some people wanting to call it the balloon script. And I think this is a good example because when I look at this and I look at the main line of the superscript consonants, I recognize that they're not different from the traditional Pallava script at all. The only differences here um, is the we can say the elongation of the vowels and of the subscript consonants. And so it may be possible to call this a different script style, or maybe it's the same script, but a different font, or maybe it's a, a different calligraphic style. And among these questions, is this a script or a font or a style? I would have to say yes and no to all of them. You know, these questions are subjective and it depends on how you choose to view the script and and what is your purpose or what's your benefit in describing one script in relation to other scripts. So uh, in a few closing remarks here, uh, the label Pallava, it, it may be correct. Uh, there may have been direct uh, you know, um, association of the Pallava in Southeast Asia, or it may be misleading. Uh, and even though those of, uh, those of us in this field are familiar with the term, we should use it with caution because people who are not familiar with our area studies of inscriptions and scripts in Southeast Asia could be confused. For labels like late Southern Brahmi, they're not incorrect, but they're also quite general. So they're not necessarily useful in helping us to distinguish the types of scripts. And as for a traditional categorization like Pallava, post Pallava, um, I think these could be problematic because they obscure uh, details and they're also um, 
we haven't really confirmed them in modern times based on relative dating. And so that model was built about a century ago, and it hasn't really been tested since then. And a lot of new inscriptions have been found. So in concluding, I would just like to say that the script, the traditional script categorizations deserve reconsideration. Uh, and this is especially important because we need to recalibrate we need to recalibrate paleographic dating standards uh, since art historians and archaeologists are still heavily reliant on our work, and yet we're using a model from 100 years ago. I also think that overgeneralized labels can hide variations, so we have to be very thoughtful in how we decide to label scripts. And I think that script evolution in Southeast Asia was probably more gradual than previously thought. Um, so in closing, I would just like to say it's important to remember that labels are subjective creations, they're not objective realities. And so, for example, when we talk about the Pallava script or post Pallava script or something, these are not historically accurate things. You know, if we went back 1,500 years ago and we asked the people, what are you writing, they would not have called it Pallava script. Uh, and they may not have recognized the same categories of change that we recognize today. And with that, it's also worth saying that when we propose when we propose new labels for scripts, we can say that those labels are strong or weak, but not necessarily that they're correct or incorrect. It depends on the subjectivity of the researcher and what they're what they're trying to say by the usage of these labels. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Uh, Hunter for your great presentation and just join, joining in to fill in the gap of the moderation while you are you were presenting and uh, I would like to maybe invite uh, anybody from the panel or the audience to ask uh, any question uh, to Hunter following his uh, very informative presentation. Uh, maybe just to share because I if, if I can, okay. uh, just, uh, but yeah, th this question are very, very interesting. And I just want to highlight the fact that it has also some contemporary issues because I, I participate marginally to the uh, work on, on, you know, encoding with Unicode, you know, Unicode, the, the universal encoding letters. And there are debates, infinite debates to uh, try to distinguish different scripts. And for instance, with the time script, uh, so there was this question are time script from Laos, time script from Lamna, time script from Lu, current are different script, or are there this um, variation of the same script? And of course, there are political issues that uh, at stake also because countries like Laos say, yeah, it's a different script. And at the end, Unicode that made some very, very long discussion about what is a script and it made different, you say, but the font, but Unicode used the term glyph, that the glyph is a particular shape of a letter, so I think of the attractive, uh, I don't know how to say it, the abstract conception of what, what, what a letter is. And there are 100 pages on discussion of what is a script, what is a variation of a script, and it has a really practical uh, uh, issue, even in, a, in computer science. So it's a, I think it's a very complex, and uh, there are a lot of many uh, uh, things, different things that are at stake, like political and sociological or whatever. Thank you for your comment. Yeah, I agree that it's problematic. And, and also the, the fact that many of these labels can have a little bit of loaded meaning. I notice you're kind of mentioning on the lines of like, for example, nationalism and how people interpret the way that we call scripts and where they come from and how they're influenced and stuff like that. Um, I think it's worth mentioning, you know, like in, in, in Thailand, often the Khmer script or Khmer art is called Kham, for example. And so that's an example of how uh, labels can be used for objectives which may not be purely academic and which actually could present obstacles for our understanding of something. Uh, Dr. Peter, I noticed you have your hand up. Yeah, I can start the video, by the way, but that doesn't really matter. No, thank you for a very uh, good presentation. I quite agree uh, that we have to to, that every, everything has to be reassessed anyway. And this is certainly uh, an important one, as others have pointed out, the names, the labels, and the methodology. I was a bit confused at first when I read your title because I didn't know what you know, traditional labels meant. And I would maybe call them modern labels. But anyway, the problem is we have no traditional labels as you 
pointed out. We don't know if we went to a learned person, a scribe or a Brahmin, a thousand years ago, a thousand five hundred years ago, and asked him what would he say? We don't know. What script are you writing in? We don't know. Um, even the Brahmi and Karoshti names, there's no actual contemporaneous evidence for them. The use of the, these terms come from the lists in the Valita Vistara of 60 scripts that the Bodhisattva studied. And the first two are Brahmi and Karoshti. And because these were the prominent ones, and because there's, there's a little bit more evidence maybe for Karoshti, but there's no real evidence for the name Brahmi, and some Chinese evidence uh, a bit later, including for Southeast Asia, I think several Chinese documents. One for Funan says that they use, they make uh, long script, uh, scriptures using the, I think, Fun script, I, I forget. So yeah, that's a, a big problem. There are, we don't know the traditional labels. So what do we use? I use Southern, uh, I use Southeast Asian Brahmi now as a stopgap. And just to put it into, there's a group, we have Central Asian Brahmi, we have Northern Brahmi, we have uh, Southern Brahmi, Southeast Asian Brahmi. It's sort of just a general marking of what family it belongs to. But uh, that's also because, like many others, I don't feel Palawa really is helpful. So the real question is, what is helpful? Not really what is correct, since we don't know. So thank you very much, and I hope you uh, continue to unravel these mysteries. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, that's kind of why I was mentioning that the labels themselves are in fact subjective. And so, yeah, for yeah. example, when you talk That's about like, like Southeast Asian Brahmi versus um, Brahmi and other regions, they're useful in, in indicating how the script used in Southeast Asia appears different from the Brahmi based scripts used in other areas. Um, but then for example, when we're not looking at other areas, when we're only looking at Southeast Asia, if we call everything Southern Brahmi or Southeast Asian Brahmi, it also kind of groups everything into a single category, which isn't necessarily useful if we're trying to draw out distinctions or if we're trying to draw out small variations. And so, but, you know, and I've, I've spoken on this topic, actually a number of people in this, in this um, workshop, I've had discussions with you about, um, even recently with Dominique, I had mentioned this because in, um, for example, in the museum in Simrip, they have a large script board <clears throat> And they label all of the scripts following the traditional art categorization in Khmer art. Uh, and even Dominique had mentioned that he doesn't necessarily agree with this and he didn't know exactly where they got this from. And so I think there's, it's not really consistent how we label scripts, um, but I think that it's something, I think that often when we deal with inscriptions, we focus more on the content and less on the script style. The script style we often tend to consider as is just like a, a detail. And so since it is overlooked, it, it almost is something which can provide additional information uh, if we only kind of pay attention to that and try to analyze it a little bit more closely. Yeah, no, good, I agree with all of that. And I think certain topics we certainly should discuss, question and reassess and not expect consensus or finality. Some things will, the research will go on forever, like the, like the Wat Prangam inscription. That shows up, okay, what is it? Southern Brahm, uh, Southeast Asian Brahmi, is it Palawa? Is it balloon script? And so on. So those are, already that's an interesting addition to the debate. These are sort of ongoing debates, I, I think. Another example, if I can, if there's time to bring in from India, is the Baikshuki script, which was a name from Bikshu, given by um, the Arab 
or Central Asian uh, scholar, Al-Biruni, I suppose, uh, about the 12th century to the script used in Bihar. Uh, some Tibetan documents call it Sindhavi from Sindh. And it also was known as the box-headed or nail-headed script. And uh, Dimitrov, Dragomir Dimitrov, has studied this very carefully and written a very excellent book. And he, he absolutely wants to call it Sindhavi and doesn't want us to call it Baikshuki. So these debates go on in every, every nook and corner of South and Southeast Asia, I think, and they should continue. Thank you for your comment. Does anyone else have a question or comment to contribute? Okay, if there are none, we will move on to our final uh, per, uh, final presentation for the day. Last but not least, certainly, uh, Dr. Dominique Scotif will be presenting on the CIK and Dharma research programs. Uh, Dr. Dominique, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, actually, uh, uh, most of you already uh, saw uh, um, this, this presentation or uh, an appropriate uh, uh, presentation about the CIK and Dharma, but uh, it's important for me to, uh, to remain exactly uh, what we are doing and to, uh, and to, to ask for, uh, for new co collaboration to this, uh, to this research program. So I, I'm trying to share my screen. While we're waiting, does anyone have any questions for any of the presenters who have already gone? Anything you would like to contribute or ask while we give Dominique a chance to get back online? Okay, we have a question from Patrick. Patrick asks, uh, Gregory, if you're here, Patrick asks, I have a question. I'm intrigued by Gregory's idea of manuscripts being a kind of inscription. To me, the difference has to do with timing. Inscriptions are generally older, whereas manuscripts are younger. Could you say a bit more, please? Uh, yeah, so I just, uh, I show some example where manuscripts are much more, much more older than inscription. And as I say, the, the common definition for inscriptions is to say that they are lasting and that's what characterize inscriptions is their durable nature and I just highlight the fact that some manuscripts are more lasting than inscriptions and that inscriptions are not meant to be durable. So if it is true that many inscriptions last for centuries and sometimes for more, uh, it's not specific to, uh, to, uh, to inscriptions, both because other material can be durable as well and also because some inscriptions are not meant to last. So it cannot be a main criterion to define inscriptions. So what I intend to say, I don't know if I was clear enough, Hunter. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I was on mute there. Gregory, uh, uh, Patrick has said thank you and he's commented this is something to think more about. Um, by the way, I forgot to mention this morning, Mr. Han Chun Thang, is uh, not well this morning. So he was sadly unable to join. And so we're, we're sad that he wasn't able to make it. I've been told that Dominique is now trying to reconnect. Oh, and here's Dominique, he's with us yes. right now. Yes. Okay, yeah. so we'll give Dominique a moment to get ready. Um, also, before Dominique starts, we have a question from, a few questions up from Sopietra, um, asked if the presentations would be available uh, for so Pietra, what our plan is, um, so since this workshop was a closed workshop, we kind of wanted to give everyone an opportunity to present on material which is perhaps unpublished. So we will ask everyone again, and if all of the participants are okay, then we plan to take this entire event, event and upload it as a video online, but we'll need to get approval from everyone first. Uh, Dominique, are you ready to go yet? Yes, so, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm really sorry. As I told you, I just arrived in Kampen and uh, the connection of the hotel where I am stuck is not good. No problem. So, uh, if yeah, you need, you... Dom 
Dominique, if you, yeah, yes, if if your connection is slow, maybe you can turn off your video and just upload your presentation and speak. No, I finally managed to contact with my uh, with my phone. Uh, okay. Can you see my, uh, my my screen also? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, as I told you, first, thank you for uh, for invite, inviting me to participate. As I told you, uh, some of you probably already seen uh, most uh, of the information I will provide in this uh, presentation. Uh, but uh, it's important for me to remind uh, what uh, the CIK program is, uh, which is now in, uh, in the framework of the Dharma research programs. Because uh, it's uh, we we are still trying to uh, to gather collaboration to uh, to gather more data on inscription. So, uh, in two thousand and two, um, a first meeting uh, with uh, the Crown authorities, uh, which that is to say, the apps around the Ministry of Culture and Fine Arts, uh, the FAO, but also uh, with uh, Thai scholars. Um, we saw there's a necessity to continue uh, to, uh, to improve uh, the inventory uh, started by uh, George Seves of inscriptions, uh, which is published in the uh, Tom 8 of the Inscription du Cambodge, uh, as it's a very useful uh, book to identify the inscription, to see where they are published, and to check if uh, they, are, they are new or not. So uh, we had a lot to do first to uh, improve the inventory of the already known inscription, uh, to check all the information we had about them, uh, but uh, to do the same to newly discovered inscription, to gather uh, legible, legible uh, documentation, um, to create an electronic corpus, and after that, to, uh, to share all those data with any scholars uh, who would like to have in, in information on inscription. And of course, uh, because it's uh, the, the main point, the main goal to publish or republish text and, uh, and translation of uh, inscription. Uh, so, uh, as I told you, uh, one of the of the point was to identify the old inscription, the old inscription, because lots of uh, of data provided by, by CDS were not uh, good anymore. So uh, for this, especially in Cambodia, uh, we had to um, to visit all uh, the museum the. Uh, we, we made uh, inventories of the different deposits, like, like here, the uh, Encore Conservation, but also uh, in Vietnam and Thailand and Laos, we did the same, thanks to uh, the collaboration with, uh, with my colleagues uh, uh, here in Vietnam and in Laos, Michel uh, Loria uh, de dealt with, uh, with uh, the, the Khmer Corpus in Laos, for example. And uh, and the point was to identify both the old one and the new one. Uh, a good example of the necessity to do that uh, is here in the Phnom Kulen era, uh, area. Uh, there is a temple called Phnom Storach, where a very well-known inscription uh, is on uh, on the, um, uh, a dojum. And just, just in front of this inscription was an unknown inscription, which appears to be uh, the most ancient inscription of the Phnom Kulen. So uh, it's uh, important not only to go in the different deposits and museum, but also to go on the field to check all the, all the data uh, of uh, uh, localization of the discovery uh, localization of the inscription today and so on. Uh, <clears throat> of course, uh, lots of new inscription appeared uh, since uh, 20, uh, the last 20 years. Um, 
so um, an important task we had was not only to gather information but also uh, to gather uh, a documentation of of uh, of uh, of the inscriptions and the readable documents so um, sorry it's a bit early so uh, we did all of course uh, rubbings traditional rubbings uh, which are afterward uh, digitized because they will be uh, put online afterward, but uh, are already uh, available if you contact a fair library in Paris. Uh, um, so uh, we have a collection covering um, around 900 uh, inscriptions in Paris, maybe 1,000 uh, of rubbing and also uh, new technologies here it was in lao in in what we did rti of uh, of inscription so i am not i don't know if you are familiar with this uh, this technique but uh, the point is to make a lot of photographs with uh, with different lights and after thanks to a software you can move the light and suddenly the inscription uh, appears so on the top you get the inscription with uh, natural light and on the bottom the inscription process processed by by a computer as you can see is definitely easier to read uh, depending of uh, the place uh, where you put the light you will see a, a different letter uh, appearing uh, we are also a lot using uh, 3D modeling, as, uh, which is uh, actually photogrammetry, especially on inscription on rocks, uh, because it's sometimes difficult to get uh, a, a good rubbing of this inscription because uh, the, the surface is not uh, perfectly flat. So, uh, so with uh, 3D modeling, we can uh we can get uh, quite uh, legible uh, documents uh so uh where was it discovered where is it stored um so text good documentation photograph rubbings but also other information like uh the kind of stones which is used so we are working in collaboration with uh, a laboratory in, uh, in Los Angeles uh, with Christian Fisher, with uh, analyzing the sandstone, the schist used uh, for inscription, trying to identify the place uh, where this uh, sandstone have been, uh, have been found uh, or schist and to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to study them, which is very interesting to, uh, for the question of the site of the production of the sculpture or the inscriptions themselves. Uh, another important uh, income of, uh, of the program is to create uh, um, uh, an electronic corpus of the inscriptions. So uh, thanks to uh, software like Text Wrangler, you can uh, look uh, any occurrences of um, of uh, a sentence, uh, a word, and so on. So it's very very useful to uh, to see parallel uh, to, uh, to 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 better understand the inscription. To sometimes just to identify an inscription, inscription is, uh, is uh, new or not. So for the moment, uh, doing all this, we managed to, uh, to, to gather readable documents to uh, around 90% of the inscription. And, uh, and we have an electronic text for the same, uh, same percentage of inscription. Uh, of course, I'm considering for the electronic text only the readable uh, inscription. Sometimes uh, they, they resist uh, definitely to any any reading. Um, and the inventory uh, is uh, continued, and now we have like more than 
1560 inscription. To share this, uh, this information, we have a first, uh, soft, uh, a first uh, uh, website uh, specially dedicated to the corpus of, uh, of prayer inscription, where you uh, will be able to find uh, the inventory. Uh, so uh, today uh, it's a bit of an old version, but uh, within the next few weeks, uh, the last version of the inventory will be made uh, available. Uh, it's very important to provide also other tools like bibliography and so on. So it's very important if you're writing on an inscription on a specific text to let us know because uh, like this, we add this uh, in, uh, in the inventory and we add the bibliography uh, here, the references. So uh, it helps to, uh, to disseminate your work, to share it uh, easily. And, uh, and for us, uh, it means that, uh, okay, we, uh, we don't have to, uh, to check again uh, a text, to read it again if it has already been uh, well published. So it can save a lot of time in the process of identification of new inscriptions. <laughs> you will find also on this website uh, the files we are using, which are available also in Khmer, in French, in English, and uh, soon in Thai, uh, to, uh, to show uh, all the information we want, we need to give a new K number. So, of course, sometimes you, uh, you just don't know. So answer. Uh, the most important part of this is uh, the readable documentation, of course, because it helps us to, uh, to, uh, to, to check if the text the inscription is new or not. But uh, there is also all the information that you can gather on the field, like uh, the provenance, uh, etc. Um, for this, it's very important, especially in Cambodia, to, uh, to ask people to, uh, to write in Khmer, but also uh, in Thai or uh, in Islao, uh, the name of, uh, of the villages around, because uh, a lot of things are, uh, the, 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 the official data are evaluating a lot, and it's, it's important to have the, the name of the location as it is known by, uh, by the people living on site. Uh, and finally, uh, you will find different tools on this website, like a uh, paleographic uh, chart that I created uh, years ago uh, to help uh, students to, uh, to, to learn how to decipher. So uh, it would be interesting to continue this work. Uh, I've done my part, honestly, but uh, I think that now we have, uh, we, are, we, we continued also already uh, up to the 16th century, and it would be interesting to, uh, to continue this, uh, this future paleography uh, uh, The numbers and the foils. Uh, the, the last uh, and most important stage for dissemination of, of all the data is the Dharma project. It's a European Research Council project, uh, which is funded uh, for uh, six years uh, by the European community. Um, it's uh, very important because uh, as UNFAO uh, and CNRS and uh, and with a colleague uh, in India, in Cambodia, in Thailand, and so on. We are uh, working in a general corpus, including not only uh, India, but also uh, in the United States. Uh, and all, all the countries where the influence of, of India has been uh, crucial. So, uh, this project aims to do the same uh, 
uh, that we are connecting the connecting uh, uh, for uh, the clear inscription, but to different purposes uh, like this and to, uh, to definitely it will help to study not only uh, clear inscription but clear inscription uh, and their uh, environment to see parallel parallels to see a connection between the different kingdoms and uh, influence uh, between the different uh, kingdoms and times. So uh, this, uh, there is four more years uh, for this project. Uh, and uh, at the end, the point would be to put online all the data. Uh, it's uh, an important point for uh, the European Research Council as uh, for only uh, open source uh, Result. So all the photographs of rubbings, uh, photographs of RTI, and so on, will be made uh, available online. Uh, the electronic uh, corpus also, and uh, translation validated by the by the Dharma project, uh, which can be improved uh, and so on. So uh, at the end, so it's already uh, you can. Can go on the, uh, the website Dharma Project RC uh, to, uh, to, to see a book description of this program, uh, give you a better idea of uh, its aim. It's not only on calligraphy, it's also, it's also an archaeological art of the uh, in Cambodia and uh, in Indonesia. And, uh, yeah, but uh, but the main part is uh, is, uh, is, is uh, formation of uh, an inscription. Uh, yeah, and the point will be to uh, to put all uh, the readable documents online. Like here, it's an example of the uh, first try. Which has been done by the Ecole Française Latin for inscription. It's a kind of thing, and they're going to do the same kind of thing uh, for, uh, for Cambodia uh, as well. And, uh, and you can see also here uh, the uh, project uh, on Champa, which uh, will give you an idea online with what can be done. So, this uh, website provides uh, translation and photographs of all the inscriptions from Champa. So uh, it takes a lot of time because uh, Champa is like 250 inscriptions. Uh, Cambodia is already more than 15. But, and if you add this India, Indonesia, and so on, uh, Huge amount of data to, uh, to deal with, but uh, for more years, and I think that we will be able to uh, share uh, a very, uh, very important database online. Uh, to, uh, to achieve this goal, we are um, uh, trying to, uh, to, to make collaborations through the development of. Understanding, we have one uh, with the uh, of Culture and with uh, Absara in Cambodia. Uh, we, uh, we have one with the uh, Serendon Center in Thailand. And uh, we are trying to organize uh, on a regular basis uh, a geographic workshop. So, uh, this one was uh, taken with uh, Serendon and it's organized by the of Gautier. Another one was, uh, was organized a uh, few years ago. Uh, the first one was in 2009, and actually it was a co organization with the CKS, the Ministry of Sydney, with the FAO and the Absara, uh, in the framework of the plastics uh, conference. So, uh, so, yeah, we are trying to. Uh, to Gather uh, all uh, the 
scholars uh, to see uh, this situation. Uh, and of course, an important kind of organized by the uh, so, um, so yeah, uh, some publication of made of inscription uh, in the, uh, in the uh, if you uh, like if you are sitting on but also in Udaya, in Pomeria, in Sisasat, of course, uh, and so on. So uh, we are trying to publish lots of inscription, of and, uh, and to bring on this, uh, this uh, very interesting idea, collect the important history. So, uh, well, yeah, it was just to give you an idea of the project and, uh, and to, uh, to, to ask you for help to, 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 uh, to provide information and discover the description that would be uh, added to the inventory. Dr. Soutif, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I think that your microphone is having some problems. The sound is not very good for the last few minutes. Could you try maybe to speak closer to your microphone? Thank yes. you. Uh, is it better? Uh, a bit better. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's, uh, yeah, I don't know. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. So if you have any question, uh, yeah, feel free to answer. OK, um, are there any questions or comments for Dominique? Gregory, are you coming on to ask something here? Yes, if, if I may. Uh, Dominique, you mentioned uh, a new technique that uh, allow to uh, to change the light direction. I can't remember the, the name of this technique, but thanks to this technique, were you able to read or to read again inscriptions that were not readable in the past? Can we have new readings thanks to this technique? Actually, it can be of, uh, of great help for, uh, for really erased letters. Uh, I know that it, already, uh, it was already by Dominic Kudos on the uh, inscription from Lao. Uh, but uh, honestly, it's, uh, you, you don't read an entire inscription with this. It's very, very boring uh, because you have to move the light all the time. So, uh, so it's, uh, an, an, it's a huge amount uh, of, uh, of photographs. So it's very heavy on a computer to, uh, to have an old inscription. So uh, the point is to identify the really erased part and to make RTI only on those parts. And yes, it can be of great help. So combination between this photogrammetry and the other things, uh, if after that you can't read, uh, forget it, you will not be able to read. But the example you show is very, uh, very impressive, huh? very impressive. Yeah, uh, honestly, uh, it's not uh, it's not an erased inscription, so it's more more uh, to, uh, to show off. But uh, but yes, generally speaking, it works very well. The good point is that the, the, the stuff, the software, and the technology is uh, it's a free software. So you can download it uh, on the web, uh, but uh, uh, and it's not not really difficult to do. Uh, we we, uh, we had the opportunity to, uh, to to ask somebody who knows it very well to uh, to ask him to come and to show us how to do it. But just you need just uh, uh, 
a simple camera uh, like uh, black balls to reflect the light and the portable uh, flash and that's it. So it's, uh, it doesn't cost anything. Uh, I think that the, the whole set, except the camera, of course, uh, cost us like uh, $30. Uh, so uh, it's really costless and, uh, and the software are free. So it's, uh, but uh, it's, it's very good to have somebody, uh, best point, best way is to ask somebody who deals really with this software to come and to process a lot of inscription. But the processing is, uh, takes a lot of time and uh, can be improved by somebody who really knows uh, the software. So, uh, yeah, it's better to ask somebody that uh, uh, usually when we are doing this, we are trying to coordinate uh, between different scholars and to, uh, to make somebody come for a few weeks and uh, working. Uh, it's very do, you think, do you think you replace the, the rubbings or do the rubbing have, still have a future? No, uh, honestly, I prefer reading on the rubbings to get a general overview okay. of the text. Uh, it's, uh, it's mainly to, uh, to help you to decipher the, the horrible parts. So uh, you personally, I, I definitely, I can't, uh, I can't stop uh, the rubbing. We are still doing them. Uh, not only because it's pleasant to read on them, but also because we know uh, that uh, if you take care of them, they will, uh, they will stay. We have uh, rubbings uh, one century old in France and they are still okay. And uh, the photographs I took during my PhD, well, it's, it's already uh, 15 years ago, but uh, only 15 years after, some of them are totally black. Uh, and it was uh, because it was JPEG and it was not stored on a very good format. So uh, uh, if you, have, you are a real, uh, archivist and you, uh, you have several art days, uh, maybe you can protect uh, digital data, but uh, how long, for how long? Uh, the rubbing is a good solution. Actually, we are digitizing now the rubbing, we are making photographs of the rubbing, but uh, sometimes it's important to uh, to, uh, to go and check the rubbing itself. So especially as we, sometimes we have 10 uh, sheets of paper for one inscription. And of course we can't photograph is 10. So we choose what seems to be the better part. But if it's the better for, uh, for the main text, maybe it's not the case for certain detail. So no, for the moment, uh, there's still a future, future for uh, for Rubik's. And I, I would even say that if it was not so uh, complicated to do, I will even do uh, Lotin de Laval, which are uh, rubbing without saying, because it's definitely a multi of the inscription, which allows you to, uh, to read other stuff. It's, uh, it's very cool. Dominique, I have a question. You were talking about revising the K number list. Um, I would like to know, uh, first off, when, when, when you assign new K numbers, who is responsible for the assigning of these numbers? And I also want to ask, now are you only registering K numbers for inscriptions in Cambodia, or do you continue to assign K numbers for inscriptions outside of Cambodia also? Ah, okay, so K number like uh, we are, uh, the FAO is, has been uh, in 2002, it has been decided that the K number will be given by uh, the responsible of the CIK project uh, program uh, today uh, and the FAO uh, because it's uh, FAO inventory, it's ZS inventory, so we are continuing the 
continuing this inventory. Uh, so if you need a K number, you have to provide me with photograph uh, to first me, of course, and, uh, and to provide me uh, information uh, to check if it's really a new one or not, and to, uh, to, to, to continue the archives of the inscription. Uh, and I, I, I can provide a uh, number uh, in a few days if I have all the information. Um, of course, uh, it's not only the inscription of Cambodia. Uh, it would make no sense. It's uh, inscription uh, of uh, the old Cambodia. So it's uh, inscription of the Khmer world, uh, inscription in Khmer or in Sanskrit related to, uh, to, uh, to the Khmer kingdoms. So uh, sometimes there are mistakes. For example, uh, this inscription from Dharavati uh, we saw before is a good example because there are few uh, more inscriptions in, uh, in the in, in, in CEDES inventory because they are in Sanskrit. And uh, when, when CEDES received the text, uh, he, he put them in the, in the K list because it was easier to find it back after a while. But uh, honestly, uh, we are trying to separate this. Uh, other people are dealing quite well, I must say, uh, with small inscription. So it's important to, to make different uh, purpose to, uh, to compare them. Uh, and, and this inscription, actually, uh, somebody asked me a K number for it, and it has been decided that, of course, we will not give them, because it's uh, definitely not from, not Khmer, it's, uh, let's say, more. So, uh, yes, but of course, uh, we are providing K numbers for inscription in Thailand, in Lao and Vietnam. That is the reason why it's so important to get linked with uh, uh, local institution. So, the strong link between uh, the FAO and the Sandland Center is a uh, uh, great help for this. Unfortunately, we were supposed to, uh, to, to start to go on the field together. Uh, last year, and uh, for uh, pandemic prison, uh, it has been postponed. But uh, but the idea is to help also the SAC uh, to uh, to improve uh, their database, and uh, and in exchange, I'm providing a lot of information to the CIK inventory. It's not the only inventory of Khmer inscription, by the way. The, but I think that today it's the most uh, complete uh, one, the most accurate one. Are there any other questions or comments for Dr. Sotif? And I see there are none. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation, Dominique. So we've reached um, the end portion of our workshop for today. So I would like to open the floor once again, if you have any questions for any of the presenters, or if you have a comment that you would like to contribute, you're free to do so now. If anything, anyone has something extra they want to add. Okay, so um, before we conclude, I want to mention again that we are planning, someone says there's a question for us in the chat and why do I not see it? Okay. And I see a question from Katna. Katna in Cambodia asked a question of me. She asked, is the problem of deciding whether script variety in the same period or for adopting a new script style? Do I have an idea about updating? Um, do I have an idea about how to determine the steps of updating the style of Brahmi script specifically for Cambodian inscriptions? Um, 
not specifically at the moment. Um, with my presentation today, it was not my intention to try to propose new scripts or new categorization. My point was mainly at this point to raise um, concerns uh, about the troubling nature of, of script labels and typologies and how they can be complex and how they do deserve reassessment. Uh, for Cambodia, uh, it would definitely take a lot of work. We would need to go back and assess all the earlier inscriptions and compare them paleographically to see where there's similarities and differences. Uh, this is certainly one of the things I'm working on. So uh, if you're interested, I can uh, keep you in touch if I have any publications coming out on this. Um, did anyone else have any comments about script styles? I remember, Dominique, I had mentioned you. We had, had discussed before about um, how they're used in Cambodia. Normally in Cambodia, do they just use pre Angkorian and Angkorian, or is it predominant these days to use Pallava or Brahmi, or what's the, what's the norm these days? Um... Well, if you are working on Cambodian inscription, because we are a Khmer centrist, uh, we are talking about pre Korean and Korean. But uh, it's uh, it may be a, a, a wrong way uh, if we are if we want to try to to uh, to compare the different uh, uh, parallels with Mon uh, and and so on. It's uh, it's not a good idea to call them pre Korean and Korean. So that's what I'm still using because it's very convenient for us and it works quite well. And uh, and there is a, a very strong evolution between uh, the pre Korean and the Korean period. But if you see uh, the uh, uh, bubble shape um, scripts that we saw in this uh, in this beautiful uh, inscription of Dravati. Uh, we have very similar uh, uh, letters used in uh, Southeast uh, Cambodia and uh, and South Vietnam on uh, on uh, on schist inscription. Uh, it's not exactly the same, but definitely it, rem it reminds us this uh, this manuscript, and uh, and it would be interesting to uh, to compare them and to understand why. Uh, they are using uh, so close script. So uh, using uh, pre Korean uh, characters uh, to describe uh, this Bardetti inscription is definitely not a good idea. This might also indicate some of the problem. Like when we look at Cambodia, basically the ancient Khmer realm was the only significant culture that had political control within Cambodia. Whereas when we compare to Thailand, they tend to break it down into like a Tawarawadi style and a Srivijaya style and Lobri or Khmer style. And so they can't- yeah, but if you think about it, it's not that simple in, in, in Cambodia too. Uh, in North East Cambodia, you've got uh, inscription in Khmer, including Cham vocabulary. Uh, you get very specific uh, used uh, at the east of the Mekong that you find uh, nowhere, uh, nowhere else. So uh, no, it's uh, there are variations also, but it's uh, it's it, it just testifies the, the, the volunteer of uh, centralization of of uh, the Khmer Empire who wanted to erase these uh, specificities, but uh, and it almost worked, but you have to to uh, to, to look for them and uh, and there are still clues that these specificities exist. Dr. Skilling, did you Even want to add Cambodia. something? I just wanted to say I'm a bit out of touch too, uh, that I believe in Vietnam now they call what was formerly pre Angorian is called post hoc eo, uh, certainly for the art and I think for the script as well. When I was there, the two museums in Ho Chi Minh City, one had already changed, and all the labels would say uh, OKL culture, post OKL culture, and the other one would say the Angorian, but uh, they told me those would be changed too. So this again comes to the question of labels, as we mentioned, nationalism, chauvinism and so on. So the same inscription 
uh, even if it's from Thailand, can be called post-Okeo script, pre angkorian script. Uh, I don't know if we say, Utong script, we don't say, I think we say Dwaravati or Padawa. So yeah, if it, that's why I say, I don't think there's much hope in expecting agreement, rather open discussion is good. I agree with you. I don't think there will be any consensus, but I think there's value in the discussion. Does anyone have any other questions or comments you would like to contribute? Okay. Um, I would like to mention one more time that um, we had intended this as a preliminary event. So we do plan if the situation improves and travel restrictions ease and we're able to cross borders easily, then we still hope that um, sometime, hopefully next year in 2022, maybe in the later half of the year, we, we still plan to try to arrange a physical workshop in Cambodia. And uh, so we hope that all of you would be able to attend and we intend to uh, invite a number of other people also. Um, do any of you at this point have any comments or suggestions, things that you liked about this workshop or things that you would like to see different about a future workshop? Okay, um, we will be sending out a questionnaire for you. And so I wasn't sure if you would have much to say now, but certainly we'll, we will be looking forward to hearing your responses to uh, how you perceived this workshop and how you think uh, future workshops may be more beneficial uh, or more advantageous. Uh, just a quick overview, we were thinking something like maybe two days, maybe two and a half days and bring everyone together. And that way we can not only present our work, but we can enjoy coffee breaks and lunches and dinners together, or maybe even like a short tour around uh, sites in Siem Reap or something like that. And so we certainly look forward to your feedback and we hope that you have some, some positive events for that. Um, before we close, I would just like to say a big thanks to the CKS staff. Um, in the process of preparing for this workshop, you have all heard from me very frequently, um, but most of you have not been in contact with the CKS staff. And so I would like to mention that there's a team of four or five people who have been very involved in the preparation and the planning, and without them, none of this would have been possible. And so, so we, we want to say thank you to them. Um, also, as when we were planning the original event, we did have some positive feedback from both APSARA and the FAO. And so we hope that in the future, if we have, I see today also, we have a number of representatives from Salapakon University. And so hopefully for a workshop next year, we can have a joint collaboration between our institutions and maybe build something a little bit larger and especially have more outreach towards students uh, that are associated with these different organizations or other students that you have who would be interested in uh, becoming involved in, in these sorts of workshops or from gaining from the presentations. So before I close, I'll ask one more time, or are there any other comments or questions that anyone would like to contribute? Okay, and I see there are none. So I will wrap up for today. Uh, we had a very good uh, CKS epigraphy workshop 2021. Uh, and we hope with uh, good luck that we will be able to welcome you back for another workshop next year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Hunter. Bye.